Well, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Tom. I am here with Todd Herman. Tom, it is, it's, the Todd is up, and Tom, it's the Tom and Todd show today. It is indeed. <laughs> it is indeed. Welcome, man. Yeah. Great to be here. Finally. I'm this is amazing. super excited to have you. It should yeah. be a lot of fun. You've yeah. got a very interesting concept. And I wanted, just before we started rolling, you were talking about New York is where you ended up from Canada. I was yeah. very surprised by that. And you yeah. said that's because it's the epicenter of ambition. Yeah. So what was it about ambition and, and what do you like about the realities of New York? Um, that there is this phenomenal pursuit that's always happening there. Like you don't come to New York to live a quality of life. That's interesting. What do you well, mean by that? Well, you're not there because it's easy. Because it, New York isn't easy. Um, you're there because you're you're pursuing something. Like there's so many industries that that's the place where you go, whether it's fashion or whether it's media or whether it's finance or, you know, insert the name of like 11 others. You're really, you're really on to something interesting though that I, I'm, I'm not sure how the world comes down in this. And I think I may have a weird view on this. So yeah. you're saying that they don't go there for quality of life. For me, I'm assuming what you mean is like a work-life balance. Yeah, no, like what I mean is, is like you're there, like people, it's, you meet so many interesting people that have got big dreams, big pursuits, whether they're going to make it or not. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's not the argument, but you meet people who have chosen to go to a place where I mean, quality of life in that you're not living in a 2,000 square foot apartment that you're paying $1,500 a month for, okay? Right. <laughs> there, I mean, I had friends where uh, five, six of them were living inside of a one bedroom apartment, wow. right? And But they were all pursuing the dream of living in New York City even. Like and that do could you be think there's something, um, I've often referred to my own drive as a sickness. Now I say it as a sickness, like Batman has a sickness. Yeah. So to me, even that's kind of cool. Yeah, there's yeah, a little yeah. bit of sexiness to that. Well, we're but, gonna jump into that deep with this concept. Man. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, with yeah. the whole notion of uh, an alter ego that you yeah. create for yourself, absolutely. So is when, when I think about New York, when I think about ambition, when I think about people going somewhere and giving yeah. up what some people may call a quality of life. For me, that is the juice. That is the quality, 100%. like being all in. Yeah. yeah, so my context of the quality of life that I was just talking about was like the sort of accepted one in suburbia, mm. right? That, you know, you live in a hermetically sealed home with a two-car garage, and then you get inside of your hermetically sealed vehicle, and you drive 35 or minutes to an hour to a hermetically sealed office. And like, that's very much what people's existences are right. you don't have that in in new york like it's a little bit grimy it's a little bit dirty and it and is. i love the dirt under your fingernails and and that's why for me this is what you and this is what you're hunting for in your conversations and your stories is you're like hey i love all the gloss i love all the kind of like you know zenith rising story and the the hero coming out of the journey but i want to get into the cave part like tell me about the dark part and i mean that's where i've lived for 22 years working with ambitious, whether it's mm. athletes, leaders, executives, entertainers, is shepherding them through the really challenging parts of making change happen for themselves. So that's interesting. I, I wouldn't have paraphrased what you do as making change happen. Yeah. And I think that where people have a really, really hard time with change. So what is that sort of dark night of the soul? What's the cave about? Where do people struggle with change? Well, I mean, if there's a force that we just give a name to, it's resistance, Wh whatever. And resistance can come in so many forms, whether it's just, you know, the cavalier term of fear. But, you know, what sits behind it, sometimes it's the narrative that we've got about ourselves and our story that we've really attached ourselves to. And we've used it as a way to define ourselves. And then we've locked ourselves into a cage of limits saying that I can't go and do that because no one from my small town has gone and done that mm. kind of thing. Do people hit you up a lot with the, there's someone I love, I love them so much, and they, they tell me they want to change and they ask for advice, but then they don't do anything. Do you, I get that a lot, and I've certainly lived that a lot. That's mm -hmm. probably one of the most frequent questions I get if I'm doing a Q&A. Yeah. It's either my significant other, my parents, my children, whatever, I've introduced them to a growth mindset yeah. that they reject it, they don't go for it, but I know they're unhappy. Yeah. Do you, like, my immediate response to that is, you're not going to be able to change them. Love them where they're at. Yeah. Just sit with them is usually what I say. Just sit with them. Don't try to change them. Just sit with them. Yeah. 
do you have better advice? Because Lord knows I would love to be like, say these six words, it will change them forever. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. always what I'm hoping for. Yeah. So, um, no, I mean, the advice is going to fall into the same line. I mean, people need to find the place where they need to, they need to change. Like you can't do it for them. Oh man, that's um, very bad news. Yeah, no, it's it, it, but it's, it's, it's the reality of it all. Um, so but, but the th- one thing I'll say is that, uh, we need to be really careful with the language that we use, the choices of our words and what have become just common vernacular that we use in our vocabulary are the things that people don't realize are actually trapping them. You know, uh, we as human beings, we've got this phenomenal gift of language. Language is what we use to create our worlds, mm. right? There's a great uh, a TED talk where this um, a researcher who studies language was looking at, okay, so, you know, in some cultures, they don't have the word spend. Okay. Okay. So if they don't have the word spend, like we do in our, you know, Western, you know, English culture, does that change their financial existence? Mm. So German culture, for example, doesn't really have a word for spending, like what? getting money in and then spending it, like uh-huh. thinking. And so what does that change? Well, Germans have a higher rate of savings and financial wherewithal than English speaking cultures. There are tribes in Africa along the same lines where this tribe right here doesn't have a word for the terms or doesn't have a, uh, a word spend, but this tribe over here does. And so this one has a higher level of prosperity because of that. It's really interesting. So I read one time and I have no idea if this is true, but it hit me as intuitively true yeah. that there is a shade of blue that we have lost because there's no word for it in the English language. And when there's no word for it, your mind can't conceive of it. Yes. And so it shoves it into another category. Yeah. And thusly you become effectively blind. Like even though you're seeing it, you don't perceive it as yeah. being different. It's a scotoma. A it's, scotoma. Scotoma is a blind spot. You can't see it. It's like when you're... Where does that word come from? Sc- where does it come from? Yeah. Uh, scotoma comes from... I don't know exactly if it's coming from the medical side, but the psychology. Like, is world. it a hematoma? Like, is it the same toma in this? Uh, no, 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 because that's a hematoma is a a, a physical manifestation. Like, it's a hmm. it's a it's a thing that you hold. Scotoma, right. in this sense, is in more the the psychological kind of the ethereal. Right. Um, you know, and a scotoma, as an example, would be, uh, you know, when you're walking around and you're saying, "I can't find my keys anywhere." Okay. But to play this out, imagine that they're in your pocket or they're right. in your hand and you're going, I freaking lost my keys. I can't find them anywhere. So what your mind does, because you're one of your, uh, your brain's responsibilities is to protect you from looking like an idiot to yourself. So it has to actually, it's cause it's teleological, it's goal seeking. So if you're telling yourself something, it needs to help prove it in your physical world. So when you tell yourself that you can't find your keys anywhere, the mind's processes goes, well, actually your keys are in your hand but I can't make you look like an idiot to yourself because I got to protect the identity, the, protect the self. So I'm going to deaden the nerve endings in your hand. Plus, in your what? in your cones and rods, because we don't see with our Has eyes. somebody studied this? This sounds crazy. 100%, yeah. Yeah, it's in tons of psychological texts. Yeah. How, how do they test whether it's deadening the nerves or not? Uh, great question. Um, don't have that data for you. Oh man, I'd be so interested to yeah. read those studies. That's so weird. So it definitely ties into the notions of the psychological immune system and how it's going to come to your aid and protect you from feeling stupid. But wow, yeah, uh, I've never heard that tied in that way. Well, and it's kind of, I mean, trying to tie back to like the idea that we've lost this shade of blue, it's just the language that we use with ourselves just causes us to see blind spots in the world. Like despite the fact that something's right in front of you, mm. like the opportunity is right there. But if you're, if you're telling yourself a narrative that it's not there, then you can't see it. You just can't see it. Right. Right. It's like when you've, you know, we've all had that situation where the moment we've sort of fallen off the cliff out of love with, you know, a girlfriend or a boyfriend at the time. And then all we see is their faults and it's just annoying us despite the fact that, 80% of the time they're doing amazing things for us even, but you can't see it. Hmm. That's why to get to your other point that you had talked about with regards to the person standing up and saying, Hey, like I really want something more for my, but they've got a blind spot to it. Um, you're, but it's don't quit on it, right? Like if this person is someone that you care about, then don't quit on it. Con- continue to feed the environment around the person because environment is one of the most overlooked parts of helping people make change happen. 
you know, everyone talks about habits and behaviors and all that stuff is great. And of course it's powerful, but you put someone in a completely different environment and just the environment itself through the osmosis of it can help shift and change behavior. Do you have any examples of that? And is this the same idea that you've talked about with context or is context yeah. and environment different? Uh, I would, they're similar, but different. Okay. Um, so an, an example is just, so there was a young athlete that I was working with who it's from the age of 10, Connor, uh, growing up in South Florida, hockey player, really good hockey player, really skilled. And I was talking to his parents about, listen, at some point in time, because if he wants to pursue this, he needs to get out of the environment of Florida. You know, me being a Canadian, you know, huge hockey country or whatever. Uh, and then in the northeast of the United States and some other pockets like Minnesota and even California has got a great, you need to get him into an environment where he's around the best. Because that environment is going to allow him to see the work that needs to get done in order for him to compete at a higher level. So you need to pull yourself sometimes out of an environment and put yourself into another one. Mm. And that alone, and so he did. He went to this amazing uh, private school up in the Northeast. You know, great lineage of producing, you know, uh, amazing talent in the NBA and, and hockey as well. And so Here, that's an example. Here's something that I've heard you talk about, which I think is really interesting. I'm obsessed with this notion. I think the reason that environment, the way that you're explaining it is so powerful is you're going to be like, you're going to become like the people that you want to impress. And if you're around people and they have a value set and that value set is ambition, it's drive, yeah. it's discipline, it's pushing themselves, it's reaching for greatness. Yeah. And for whatever reason you want to impress them, they're good at the thing that you want to be good at. Yeah. But you, they're cool for whatever yeah. reason, then you begin to adopt seamlessly without even really thinking about it. Yeah. You begin to adopt their values as a method to impress them. And then because the values are going to control your behavior. So to, to affect the behaviors that are going to impress this person, you're naturally going to begin to um, inhabit their value system. Yeah. And the malleability of values is something that I think not a lot of people understand. Yeah. What is your, like, what do you talk to people about in terms of values? Yeah. How do you train them to change them? Like if, if put, dropping them in with people that already have the value system, I'll call sort of the, the apex move, but what are things that people can do, you know, if they're yeah. home alone by themselves, but they want to adopt new values? Well, to go one higher, the real apex move is to change someone's identity. Okay. So values sit just outside of like the, like the way that you truly see it. Like an identity is made up of values and other, but when you, that's why the whole concept of the alter ego is so powerful because the moment that you've disassociated, disassociated yourself from the you that you're describing yourself as, and you're now acting through a new self, a new identity, all bets are off because now you're not shackled to the same behaviors, habits, values even that you had before. Same narrative about the things that happened to you or um, you know, the, the negative beliefs that you've got about your capabilities because you're acting through something different. So as a place to start by getting to your question about the values, yeah, absolutely. You know, shifting someone's just what they appreciate more. Like when you get around people who've got a high financial acumen and you're around them a lot, like I'm, I'm fortunate in New York, some of my best friends are some of the biggest people on, on wall street and money was never a skill set that I had like horrible with money. Uh, but when I moved to New York, that became a goal of mine was to, to master that skill set more and being around them, just how they talk about things, how they talk about investments are different. I'm like, well, what, but I want to get to like, why are you seeing it that way? Mm. Because I don't see it that way, but you've, because you've got, I've got a blind spot because I don't have the right questions in my head yet. So how are you appreciating this investment or how are you appreciating this paycheck that you get with this money now that you've got? And now you're going to go and turn it around and put it somewhere else to invest as opposed to other people take it and they go and they spend it on something mm -hmm. to grat self gratify or whatever. But um, talk to me about the process of, breaking out of your identity one i think that most people they're not aware they have an identity yeah. they and here's here's one of the things that i think people really struggle with i think this is true of beliefs i think it's true of identity i think it's true of values is people mistake it for truth 
So they, yeah. they're growing up in an environment. People tell them that that's how people should act, that this is what you should do. This is the things that you should value, which of course they never say. They just, yeah. they reward, they punish based on what you do, what you don't do. Um, you know, things like, do you turn the other cheek when somebody threatens you or do, you know, you got punched in the face. Did you go tell the principal or no, you got punched in the face. You go punch him back and don't come home until you do. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of those things begin to create the person's perspective, but they are all of those things because they start learning them when they're so young, they create this veil of self-evidency. It, yeah. It simply is, it has been a part of their life from the beginning. And so they have a hard time teasing out that, oh, these are all like, this is a form. Enter values here and you enter your values, enter mm -hmm. your beliefs here, enter mm -hmm. your identity here. And then that gives you the output of sort of the human and their behaviors and their neurochemical rewards and punishments and all of that. Not yeah. realizing like that's, that's how I think of it. It's, it's like a a form that you fill out or a computer program, maybe just to, to make this really easy. It's a computer program. You punch in the variables and then out comes a neurochemical response, which makes you feel some kind of way. Yeah. And that some kind of way, you're either going to move away from pain or move towards pleasure. And so once you can get people to see these are variables yeah. and you can change them, you can manipulate them how you want, you can yeah. insert new things here, then people can really begin to, to I'll say shift their identity. I'm not sure if you would agree with that or if you think identity is, is something wholly separate of that. Um, but if somebody wanted to go through the process of changing their identity, how do they go about it? How do you first make them aware or do you yeah. start with making them aware of the identity they have? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, well, I'll get to that, but I want to go back to the language thing that we were talking about, that we use language as a way to create our world. Yep. Um, and so a good example is the word you. You. So we use it all the time. We say like, you're this way. And so if someone keeps on telling you over and over again that you're a certain way, like, wow, Tom, like you're so ambitious or, mm -hmm. you know, Tom, you're, you're such a good detailed person. And depending on whether that feels good or doesn't feel good, you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm detailed. And you like reaffirm it to yourself. And then that sort of continues to stack on. And to your point about now we're programming and we're reinforcing that program, adding more lines of code to mm -hmm. it to make it, you know, uh, come to fruition with our behavior. But you, there is no you. There is no you. You cannot, I cannot put Tom Bill you underneath a microscope or underneath any sort of nuclear machine and find a you. There is a body that has many, many different expressions of this person, Tom Bill you. How you are with me right now in this interview is a different Bill you that shows up when you're around Lisa, right? So we have, the, the purpose of me really hammering home that point with people is to get them to realize that you have many identities. There is no one identity. So if you say that you're, because I've worked with you know Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Rangers, and when they put on that uniform, they have a specific credo that's being hammered away every single day of what it means to wear that uniform. And what they have challenges with is when they go home and they take off the uniform, they continue to act that way. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy, right? You've been flexing the muscle of that habit, that behavior, that mindset over and over and over again. And so what I do with them is like, well, do you have a uniform that you step into when you go home? You should. You should have a dad uniform that you put on. And what does that dad uniform mean to you? So that your kids can get a different version because I'm telling you that that version of you that shows up that's going to be a drill sergeant to them is going to wear them out. And you're going to have some like familial issues going on later on. So there's many, it's, it's we're shapeshifters. And, and this is what I'd say the self-help, the personal development, some of the spiritual rituals have done a very poor job of for a long time is hammering away at people a lot of really poor narratives that just are not true on how human beings are built and our malleability, our flexibility, the playfulness that we have built into our creative imagination where we can be and act in any way, and that's not a bad thing. That doesn't make you a schizophrenic, that doesn't make you a uh, multiple personality disorder individual. No, that makes you a human being that's simply tapping into a power that allows you to perform at your best in all the roles that you have, or the ones that are important to you. Because if I have a Navy SEAL that walks up to me and tells me that it's not important for him to be a good dad, that would be a shocker to me. So, 
you know, okay, well then if you're struggling with the fact that you've got issues at home, because that's typically where we'll go. Police officers, same thing. Some of the highest divorce rates that are out there. Why? Because uniforms mean something to people, right? And I get into it in the book and that's actually like step four of the process for like how you actually mm -hmm. start to create identities for yourself that are powerful. And the, the real power of this comes from the power of the intention. Most people are, to your point earlier, are walking around completely unaware of their own identity and they're trapped by it because they think, well, no, that's just my story. Like that's how I grow up. It's mm -hmm. like, well, good for you. Congratulations on that. That doesn't mean that you have to be that way tomorrow because we as human beings are not oak trees. We're not trees. An oak tree has to be an oak tree forever. Human beings don't have to be that story that they've been living through forever. We have the ability to shift and change rapidly. So how do you walk people through that? Is it uh, an exercise about tell me who you are? Like, how do you get them? How do you force them down a path of awareness? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't even need people to tell me who you are. I just need to look at your results and that tells me what you are. <laughs> you know, and even the word who, who you are is a dangerous question to ask people. Because when I ask you who you are, again, that comes from the spiritual traditions again. Like I'm, I'm such a nerd on this stuff. Like I want to double tap deep on all these things and, and get people to really see that sometimes the phrases, the questions, the statements, the words that we use don't help you actually make change happen. So who you are, not that it's a dangerous question, it's a misleading question because when I say who are you, Tom, you immediately go to your past and you go, well, I'm this and it's almost like an about me page. Hmm. It's your resume, right? And, and that's not helpful. So instead of what do you want them to do? Is what it are traits? you? No, it's what are you? Okay. What are you made of? Because I want something you can hold into your hand. I wouldn't know how to answer that though. Yeah, exactly. Because we don't think about it. But so what would, what's an answer that somebody's given you that you thought, yeah, they yeah. get it. Yeah. So young athlete I was working with, uh, second year in his NHL career, like National Hockey League. And I said, you know, because we kind of got into this conversation about who are you? He's the one who brought it up. And I said, no, 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 like, what are you? And he just thought to himself and he's like, I'm invincible. Like, oh, where does that come from? Where does invincible, like, where in you does invincibility sit? And he was just, well, when I think about all of the kind of tough stuff that I have done, I always get up. I'm like, great, that's a, that's a great building block to work from. You're invincible. What else are you? Because I want to get to like meat and potato stuff. There's so much, and again, people that are watching or listening to this right now, you see this, like there's so many beautiful little um, sayings or there's uh, platitudes that are shared amongst the personal, that make you feel good. I'm not a feel good guy. I'll never be the most popular person when it comes to making change happen because I'm way too in, in, in people's faces. Like I want to confront people with the reality of doing tough stuff. Like I want to pour salt on your hangnail because when I do that, what do you immediately do? You want to wash it off. You take action. Whereas everyone else, they want to get you a Band-Aid and some ointment for it. No, 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 no. Change happens from pain. So... How do you, somebody comes to you, they're an elite athlete. There's a certain amount of, um, they consent to having this done, mm -hmm. but how do you find the hangnail? How do you start pouring the salt on it? What do you make them do? Are you, is it a therapy session? You putting them on a treadmill? No, like, I don't do therapy. Like? I'm a performance guy. Okay. So performance is all about moving forward. They come to you. Then what? Yeah. So they come to me. And, uh, for, I mean, we have this diagnostic that I go to, you know, kind of measuring people on seven different pillars of like mental toughness, concentration ability. For, they're answering questions or, well, it's a diagnostic. Yeah. So that's, they're just writing down their answers or not writing them down, but they're grading themselves on scales of like one to four okay. on these different areas. Um, and that just shows me on the index, like where we've got the greatest opportunity to make a change happen. So, you know, if they're currently under indexing in their performance, and they've rated themselves low in focus, then that would be you know a training thing that I'm going to pull out and start working with them on that. The one, which is a bit of a red herring that I put in there, is motivation. Because motivation is some, not something that I work with you on. I was going to say, why is that a red herring? Because motivation is a you thing, not a me thing. I'm not here to motivate you. Like an, an elite performer doesn't look for me to motivate them. 
That's a you thing, not a me thing. Like, and all these other people who are out there trying to motivate individuals, you know, as someone who's been a practitioner of this, I mean, I've worked with people for 17,064 hours, one-on-one. Wow. One-on-one. That's not counting all of the like seminars or workshops or boot camps or speaking, you know, engagements around the globe. That's one-on-one. And so when you're working with someone one-on-one, Tom, and you understand this, like when you're working with someone one-on-one, like there is a completely different level of nuance where people are going to be sharing with you in a completely different way about what they're actually doing or what they're actually thinking about themselves in those moments when they're both succeeding or when they're under indexing and they're and they're failing and and that's really really important for anyone who's out there trying to change something in their world if it's an entrepreneur who's you know trying to change their marketing find practitioners find the ones who are working with people one on one because that stuff matters because i'm i'm only you know paid by improving someone's performance. If I keep on giving you strategies, Tom, and they're not working for you, we're not gonna be working together for a long time. Whereas in a group environment where someone's standing on stage, there's groupthink. That is a that is a natural phenomenon that exists amongst human beings where groupthink happens. Where, you know, if someone's trying to gain the love and adoration of, you know, Tom or Todd or, you know, Tony or whoever. And Tony says, that one strategy, or Todd says, that one strategy, does that work for you? And someone who just wants to be a pleaser goes, yeah, yeah, that worked for me. And then other people start raising their hand. Then the other person who hasn't raised their hand yet because they've tried it, and they're like, oh, again, we don't want to kick out of, get kicked out of our tribe. And now all these people are like raising their hands, saying, yeah, yeah, that strategy works amazing, despite the fact that it doesn't work. How much of what you do is is pure intuition? Uh, not not very much. So you've no, got- in the, in the beginning, quite a bit. I was going to say, because you've got the diagnostic, I'm having trouble following like exactly what you do. You okay. have a diagnostic because what I'm trying to do is somebody at home right now is listening. They want to have the change. They want to have the breakthrough. Yeah. What the fuck do they do is so. Okay. Well, th- that's, that's different from like, if we're talking about identity, I'm talking about, oh, that's the process of if I'm onboarding someone into my business, like into my, I love that. Yeah. So I think that'll get into the nitty gritty of yeah. like what you're trying to tease out. So they're doing the diagnostic. It's telling you. Yeah. It's telling me where they need training, like where they haven't spent much time on mastering the mental and the emotional part of their game. Okay. okay. Right. Because we're trying How much to. Is this reminiscent of a personality test? Uh, not nah, well. There's there's there there's elements of that, but you know I use a whole bunch of different diagnostics because I am not a believer. Like there's so many people who are out there who are like I'm an INFJA or INFJ or whatever it is from Myers Briggs and, and I'm yeah. like. Boy, again, what a fantastic way to trap your and limit yourself because people love to to say, you know, that's why personality tests and all these quizzes online are so popular. They go viral because they go, I'm a this. Mm. People love to discover more about themselves. But what it actually does is it traps many people because they're like, I'm an introvert and introverts don't blah, 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 whatever they say. It's like, okay, great. Now you're going to live through that. And when you hear that, you hear, all right, this person has a label now. That label has created limitations. They're no longer recognizing that they're actually a multitude of, and what's interesting is I don't know what word you would use there. Personalities, traits, multiple of identities. No, multiple of identities. So identity. Okay. So now real fast, define identity. What does it encompass? Identity encompasses, I talk about it in chapter three of the book, the different layers that get stacked on. So, you know, at this core of what we are is just like pure possibility. Like we can, we can move in many directions with our, with the kind of inborn talents of what it means to be a human being okay so there's poor core possibility outside of that creates what i call this kind of core drivers layer core drivers are things that you've that are, that you've attached yourself to and that are attached to you because of your your race your religion your values um where you're from because people don't realize just how much that stuff shapes them mm. you know well, I'm black, so that means that this, or I'm white, and that means this, or I'm Asian, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Jew, or I'm. Have you a- have you heard that study where if you take um, an Asian woman who's about to take a math test, and stereotypically women are worse at math, and stereotypically Asians are better at math, yeah, and if you prime her by saying, "Oh, you're a woman," I, I wonder how well yeah. you're going to do on the test. They'll do worse, but if you take that same, same. person. And prime them, oh, you're Asian. I wonder how well you do on the test. Yeah. Then they'll do better. Yeah. That is so crazy to me. Yeah. And when I was diving into some of your research, that was what I was thinking is like that there's some of the you're taking control of the priming essentially. Yes. 
So, all right, so keep going 100%. on that. So core drivers sit there. Um, and again, even being a part of a larger group, what like military man, police officer, you know, this. So we, we have these labels and now, because we, they're, they're the things that really can help either block someone's possibility or, you know, unleash it in many ways. Mm. We see it at the Olympics where someone who's coming out of nowhere, but now because they're wearing the, you know, the red, white, and blue on their back or the red and white from Canada or the wherever from somewhere else, they just level up because of what it means to now represent their country. Other people, conversely, I can't use it with them because I've worked with, you know, well over 100 Olympians. That actually crushes their performance. Because it's just too much weight? It's too much. Or they actually don't care. Hmm. Some people don't care. Like, it's that's not meaningful to them that they're an American or a Canadian or a Brit or an Aussie, whatever the case is. So, so that's the core drivers. And then outside of that, I call it the belief layer. So that's where your attitudes, your perceptions, um, your beliefs about you or the world around you sit. Okay. This is all shaping that identity and it's shaping it in the different areas of our life in the roles that we play, that of an entrepreneur, that of a, a parent, father, husband, wife, you know, lover, brother, sister, mom, like all those that we have. And that's why it's important that we sort of peel away the layer or peel away and show that, no, you've got many identities and we can shape you. No, you get to shape yourself because you're doing it anyway. I'm not, I'm not explaining anything to anyone that is not grounded in gravity. Like it's real. It's truth. We have many identities. Mm. We just don't think about it. But I'm trying to build awareness so that people can see it and they go, oh. Because once you build the awareness, all bets are off with people. Because now, do now, you have like archetypes of alter egos that you push people towards depending on what they're trying to accomplish? I love archetype stuff, um, but that's probably where it's a little bit intuitive, but not necessarily. You know, the the natural lean when you talk about this is people talk about you know like bringing that kind of like lion to things or that roar or whatever. But I have one client; she's in the book where I talk about. You know, that never resonates. She's this real soft-spoken, like super kind person. And her trying to bring out like an inner lion thing wasn't, wouldn't work. But for her, she's German. Uh, she, has a, she has a deep history in her family of like exploration, being in the outdoors. And she had this really great reverence for uh, a buck, like a male deer. And for her, it was like the way that it stands its ground despite the fact that a bear is coming off that's what people don't people don't see the fights between uh, a wild buck and a bear or a cougar where it fights it off with its antlers mm. people don't see that they always see the kill but sometimes the prey wins and um and a big male buck will will do that and fight with its antlers fight it off but for her what she needed because she was uh, a business owner and she again very common thing where she had a, a, a sort of a freelance marketing uh, company and you know scope creep you know it's like yeah. so now she's she's building a website for someone they go you know what we need some brochures done too you know can you add that on yeah i'll do that too and because she's so nice and kind all of this and now she's completely unprofitable mm. or she's just making you know a laughable amount an hour so the way that she started showing up in her business was through this lens of a buck that stands its ground and honors the fact that she's valuable like she is um, what she has is valuable and people need to respect that. Uh, a lion wasn't going to do that. So no, archetypes, I don't push people towards certain ones. And at the end of the day, the most common uh, sort of alter ego identity that people adopt is actually grandmas. If there was a category. Grandmas? Yeah, grandmas. Because in order for you to... These are elite performers. Uh, not, or not, these are our cops. And these, are, these are people that are either in... Um, in the business world, grandmas aren't popular necessarily in the sports world. That's not where. So who's um, becoming the grandma? Uh, so, it, and again, you're not becoming the grandma. You're adopting the traits, the qualities, or the abilities that you admire about your grandmother. Okay, I've got a, uh, a really wealthy man in, uh, in New York who's a client for a long time. And he was kind of a traditional Wall Street type that just railroaded himself towards success burned out and churned out a lot of leaders in his business but now he had a very large private equity business and his leadership team was burning out quite a bit and so when and i started working with him his identity needed to change because he was now in a completely different role that what got him to be successful 
right? So that hard charging thing, that really helped him, but that's not working now. That's gonna break his business. So he needed to step into a new identity. Couldn't figure out a way to do that. So when I was talking about like, well, who do you respect? Like, who do you admire as great leaders of, of business or just leaders in general? And he was talking about like Jack Wells or Sumner Redstone and, and these names were coming out. And so I kind of, but just talking to him, I could get that he wasn't like emotionally connected to that idea. Mm. So then I just asked him about his family because I knew a bit about it. I mean, I knew his history and uh, he started talking to me about his, uh, his grandmother. Hus her husband uh, died in the Holocaust. She had four young boys brought them over to America, classic story of, you know, settling in the Lower East Side with nothing, $70 in her pocket, raising these four amazing young men, all going on to have tremendous success. My client was the uh, son of, of one of them. And, you know, just talked with great reverence about just how like amazingly uh, nurturing she was, but really strong with an iron rod up her back with like the values of how we operate as a family. And, and I said, that's, that's who your identity is. That's. So how did the people then grab that and actually put it to use? Because yeah. when you were talking earlier about, um, you know, you need a uniform and do you have the uniform of the dad when yeah. you walk in? So I'm thinking, what's the uniform of the grandmother? But yeah. I'm guessing you're going to say it's not quite how it works. Yeah. So there's, again, there's, there's different ways to activate this. So, uh, I want to, you know, continuing on with that, it's like active, like, getting him to realize, well, what are those qualities that you just appreciate about your grandma? Like, what is it about it? Because uh, uh, the reason, well, what are those qualities? What are those attributes? What are those traits? And then, so yeah, a uniform really helps. Something, we call them totems and artifacts. Mm -hmm. Something that physical that you can put on that can help you step into that. Because again, we're acting with this intention now. Because you're choosing it. And, and that item represents what you're activating. So for him, there was no thing. There was no, some, there isn't something that he was gonna go put on. But there was a, another quality that we use is something that you use in your environment. So he had a framed photo of his uh, grandmother. And he wasn't gonna be like, you know, acting through this identity throughout his entire day. But it was when he needed to have conversations with his leadership team that he needed to like, you know, pump the brake on his extraordinarily aggressive personality and and start you know acting with a completely different intention so anytime he was about to have a leadership conversation he had this frame of his grandma sitting on his uh on his credenza or on his desk sorry and it was we we like to create triggers so there was a switch so he would turn that frame so now she was facing him what's the importance of the triggers that's really interesting to me uh the importance of it is to create rituals and, and why to, why does that matter because human beings are uh are grounded in rituals and there is an it's almost like an honoring ceremony because what i want you to do is i want you to i don't want you to dishonor the memory or the spirit of whatever or whoever it is that you are activating by not truly acting through the qualities of that individual so the conversation with him is, is like, now, you know, choose your grandmother very carefully because you, you cannot go into a conversation with your leadership team and act the way that you do and dishonor the way that your grandmother would handle that by you acting in this completely, you know, kind of wild and, you know, uh, swear <laughs> laden way because she wouldn't do that. So that trigger, again, it's just, it, it helps to send a signal through your entire electrical system that something different is happening. So interesting. Are you familiar with Tony Robbins and his whole idea of state change sure. and all of that stuff? Sure. Man, that stuff is really interesting to me. And there's something so fascinating about the human ability to change your state, like yeah. reading your stuff about alter egos. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. There's something about, um, for anybody that, that doesn't quite have their hooks into this yet, do the following exercise, sit down, close your eyes and think smile. Yeah. And what's weird is you will feel the change. Yeah. Like you'll feel a neurochemical change just by thinking 
smile. Yeah. Like you're not actually moving the muscles. You're just thinking about the smile. Yeah. And my gut instinct is if you sat there long enough thinking smile, you'd actually start to smile. And then to take this to, to where you started, that ritualistic move, there's something about birthing it through physicality. Yes. That, and I, I'd actually be really curious to understand the research or, y- yeah. you know, the, the underlying physiological thing. So I have this obsession with physiological hooks. So there, there is something about tying your mindset to physicality sure. that is incredibly important. Like when you see people trying to do a state change, athletes will do this all the fucking time. Yeah. And I've done this. I do this sometimes if I don't want to get in a cold shower and I'm like, fuck, yeah. I don't want to do this. Yeah. And I have to like state change it. I'll fucking pound my chest. There's, I don't know what it is, but dude, you do that and boom, it's like, I've got the aggression. I have yeah. exactly what I need to tackle this. And to just completely, I always think of it in terms of frame of reference, but my gut instinct is if I were to define frame of reference and you were to define alter ego, we would find that they're similar. They may yeah, not yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. overlap, yeah. but it's a no. a very similar concept. Well, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff. You're t- I mean, you talk a lot about identity with people, right? Like you're, you're, you, you're dancing around the stuff that I've been working with people on for, you know, 22 years. Mm-hmm. Really alter ego stuff is what came into my practice in 2003, 2004, um, because I just started to discover that this was the golden thread that was weaving together all of these elite people that I was now starting to work with, where they were talking about, I've got this persona that I step into, I've got this other kind of identity, I have this character that I use. And, you know, I, I played college football at a high level. I was a nationally ranked badminton player. I played sport at a high level, not pro, mm-hmm. but I was a good athlete. And my responses back to those people was always like, oh, that's really cool because I use, I use that as well. It was more like an interesting kind of connection point. Mm. And then it was me pre- preparing um, a, a U.S. swimmer, a, a lady for the Athens Games back in 2004, where it's just the way that she said it, where it just, all of a sudden all of these dominoes of past conversations came together. And I was like, wait a second. There is this consistency amongst the people who are consistently performing at their mm-hmm. best they keep on referencing this idea. There's something there. Do you know who Sasha Fierce is? Of course I know who Sasha Fierce is. Yeah, that, absolutely. to me, is when I heard... So for anybody listening that doesn't know who Sasha Fierce is, that's Beyonce's yeah. alter ego yeah. on stage. And I thought, whoa, that's so interesting that somebody that successful uses this technique to have the balls, yeah. essentially, to go out on stage, to own it, to be fierce. And she needed it. You know, when you take a look at her story, she's a gospel singing young black girl from Houston, Texas, who people would show up every Sunday. They can't wait to hear Beyonce sing Mm. gospel songs. Her dad, recognizing her talent and her love for music, gets her and Solange inside of a dance group. There's eight of them. And now Beyonce, who's used to dressing very modestly in a church environment, singing gospel hymns and songs, is now asked to sing provocative music, (laughs) dancing provocatively. She had a real internal combustion over this, right? Now, I want people to track this. Are there some things that you've got some internal combustion over right now that you're resisting against because you have a tough time seeing yourself do it despite the fact that you want to manifest it. You want to pursue that entrepreneurial career. You want to pursue that acting or that singing or you want to get out there, okay? So she then created Sasha Fierce, someone else, another identity to go out there that loved going out there and performing, loved the provocative, loved dancing that way. And that's who she would step into and activate when she went out there. Now all of a sudden she could protect for herself that sort of more innocent Beyonce. Mm. And what she found, and that's why I share in the quote, there's, or in the book, there's this great quote by the Hollywood golden era actor, Cary Grant, where he said, and again, born in Bristol, England, in a very modest family, uh, single mother, but always wanted to make something of himself. Traveled o- over to Hollywood and uh, you know, became known as this you know, charismatic, debonair, good looking guy. Uh, but at the end of his career, he had this great quote, where he said, I pretended to be somebody I wanted to be, and I finally became that person. Or he became me, but at some point in time, we met. Which I think is one of the most beautiful quotes that a human has uttered. Mm. The only thing I would change is, not I pretended, but I activated. You chose it. 
And so if you think about it, is there's this you that you've got described in your own mind right now. And I think of it like a circle of a Venn, di- a circle Venn diagram. And you've got this other self that you want to be or this kind of aspirational idea of what you want to be. And for me, the alter ego was the thing that could help bring them together. And then after a while, you're truly acting, behaving, thinking this way, and you don't need to activate Beyonce or Sasha Fierce somewhere. Because Beyonce in 2008, when she came out of her, came out with her album, famously retired Sasha Fierce. She said, I don't need her anymore. Mm-hmm. But that was her private, Sasha Fierce was always her private sort of identity. But now she could go out there and own the stage and... Uh, you know, didn't need to activate or didn't need to think about Sasha anymore because she that was what she became. How is this not pretending? Because pretending is just the word alone is has the sort of intention or the thinking of concerning yourself with the thoughts, opinions and judgments of other people. Screw them. Like it doesn't. So it's not necessarily a change in affectation but it's a change in the way that you think about it it's the way that you change the way because anytime you're trying to do something to deceive or trick other people yeah that that isn't a healthy way to be operating from because what it ends up doing is it traps you because that's that's not the healthy way that you want to build your identity but even in the book i talk about the difference in, in chapter three i talk about the difference between that outside in approach which is you trying to do things for other people, trying to impress other people, worried about what other people are thinking about you. So then you don't do the thing anymore. Concerned with, you know, what if everyone sees this crappy video that I've just done and, you know, they they judge me as being, you know, a loser on video or whatever. Or we could all see that it's just the maturation process that you've gone through. Like the Tom Bilyeu in interviews today is different than the Tom Bilyeu that came out interview number one, right? Like you're, you're, I'm, and I'm, guessing, but I know it's true, you're better at asking questions, you dive deeper, you've got a, you know, a richer set of, uh, you know, just confidence around being patient, kind of saying, you know what, you just said something, let's go back to that. You know, we were talking about that earlier. Sure. Whereas the intention of you saying, you know, this, this is how I want to show up now. I am not going to stay tethered to this past narrative. I'm going to stay tethered to these ideas that I have to be this way because someone from Topeka, Kansas has never made it somewhere or that someone in Topeka, Kansas can't be the most creative artist on the planet. What if you were the first in Topeka, Kansas to be the most creative artist on the planet and people flew into Topeka in order to see you? That would be phenomenal for you to go and do. So it's just, it's the changing in the perception of where we're coming from here. Mm. But I wanted to come back to something that you had said is like when you said you were just fascinated with this whole state change thing and that you're like getting into the science. Well, do I'm going to share you some science? Yeah, yeah. Please, so uh, a great piece of research. So there's a, a psychological phenomenon that we've got called enclosed cognition. Enclosed cognition is that we as human beings, we attach meaning and story to the clothing that other people wear or that we wear. So case in Go point. Go on. Yes. So if someone were to walk into this room with us right now and they had on a doctor's coat or a lab coat, immediately at an unconscious level, you're going to make a whole bunch of assumptions and tell a story about that person. No question. Right? So it could be that they're successful. And again, everyone's different because all of us have had different experiences with people right. in white coats. But for the most part, if it was a doctor's coat, it's that they're successful or they're, they're smart, they're detailed, um, and, and so on. So we do that. What people don't realize is that with this power of enclosed cognition, by you putting on something, you're actually changing at an unconscious level the way that you're about to go and act. Dude, I'm so with you. Yeah. So uh, there was, you know, I've done for the longest time, my whole alter ego method that I would use with athletes was like my 11 herbs and spices. Like I kept it locked away. <laughs> I didn't talk about it very much because I became well known at like really high levels in sport as the guy. I'm the, the, I'm, the, I'm the quick hit artist. I'm the quick change guy. Like when someone's playing at the US Open on Saturday and they're in a rut right now on a Wednesday, you know, meditation, undoubtedly. It is a core pillar practice that we put in place for everybody. I've been talking about meditation since 97 when yoga wasn't cool, (laughs) right? Because there is just nothing that can help align the mentally, emotional, and the physical self better than meditation. But 
Meditation ain't a quick hit thing. Hmm. So, um, you know, I didn't talk about, you know, on stages and very much around the idea of an alter ego because I really didn't want some of my compatriots to latch onto it. So, uh, but I had done a speech and word got back to this lady in the University of Minnesota, at least that's the story that I was told. And she did this great little study with four to six year old kids where they, they brought them into this room and there was this uh, kind of puzzle with a whole bunch of uh, padlocks on it. And they gave all the kids this ring of keys to unlock all the padlocks, okay? But they divided them up into groups of three. And one group, they were just in their plain clothes and given the keys. And then another group, they were told to pretend like their favorite superhero or someone that they look up to, favorite superhero. So then they do it. And then another group, they brought in a rack of clothing and there was Batman and Dora the Explorer costumes. And they said, put on the costume and, and then here's the keys and mm-hmm. let's go and unlock those costumes. Fascinating what happened. The kids that were just in their plain clothes quit on the task of opening all the padlocks because the keys that they had didn't open any of the locks. It was a red herring. They just wanted to see with frustration how long they were going right. to last. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they quit the first. They were the first ones to quit. So what's that measuring? Grit and perseverance. Two things that you know we all talk about all the time of just what it takes in order to achieve something. Right. Because you're going to need it. Now, the young kids that pretended to be Batman or whatever their favorite superhero was, they lasted longer, but they didn't last as long as the kids who had on the costume or the uniform. That is fucking so interesting. And But here's the, here's the other side effect of it. They weren't expecting to be tracking self-talk. So how kids were talking about them. Because young kids, if, you, if you're around them, they don't just keep the thoughts in their head. They're talking it out loud. It's like yeah. when they when they meet someone who's chubby or they're like, oh, why is he so fat? Like, it's right. just, you know, you're like, oh, it's just please just, you know, have some social decorum. Um, so the young kids that were just in their plain clothes would say like, oh, I'm not good at puzzles or I can't get this. I quit. Okay. So I, I can't get this. I quit. I'm not good at puzzles. Kids who were wearing the uniform though, they would say things like, Batman wouldn't quit. So I'm not going to quit. Door the Explorer always finds a way. So I'm going to find a way right? They had now disassociated from whatever their own identity was. Mm. And they started acting through these other traits of Dora, of Batman. That's kind of like me sort of putting together the pieces for everyone around why using a totem, an artifact, some sort of object is so important to help you activate those traits from the person or the thing that you're most inspired by. I want you to have an emotional connection with this new identity. That's why grandmas are chosen so often. I'm not saying like 50% of all all three egos. I'm saying if there's a category, they get chosen quite a bit because it's an easy emotional connection. Hmm. Um, That's why for that one lady, a lion wasn't going to work, but uh, a a buck did. You know, Kobe Bryant's story of, you know, Black Mamba. He's going through an extraordinarily challenging time when, it, when that uh, sexual assault case was going against him. He was losing his edge, losing it. Felt like he was losing himself in it. He was losing his what? His identity. Watched Kill Bill. Saw the black mamba in Kill Bill. Kill Bill. And said, that's, I'm going to be the black mamba on the court. I would put Kobe Bryant up against any, you know, animal biologist on the planet for knowledge of a black mamba. <laughs> he knows a lot about black mambas because when you find something that you resonate with, get to know as much as you can, as you mm-hmm. can about it because it, it's, it's like the grapple hooks. You start to get their story into you now because mm-hmm. that's where you're going to start acting through is those qualities. So Beyonce, she created Sasha Fierce. She's one of the few people that actually just sort of out of thin air created something a lot of people use and leverage something else Mm. um like i talk about in the book with bo jackson using you know his alter ego which was a character in a horror movie yeah you know when he stepped up jason Voorhees. yeah so my point about that was like you know there is science and research behind it yeah before we move off that i want to talk about self-signaling so Mm. this is a personal obsession of mine so we did a whole clothing line at impact theory it's called the self-signaling line and it was all things that you should be telling yourself where exactly the mantras and things that you should be thinking about believing yeah. because to me i feel very different if i'm wearing something that reminds me of something yeah. that is important to me yeah so and the notion of having a totem like one of the things 
a lot of people come to me and the punchline of the reason from my perspective, they're not getting where they want to get is they don't know how to desire. They don't know how to obsess. Yeah. They don't know how to marinate in something like you want this thing. Well, you have to fucking like it. Like it's yeah. really got to be a part of you. You've got to make it a core part of your identity. Yeah. And for you to make it a core part of your identity, you have to find ways to soak in it. And one of the ways is to have that totem, that artifact, the piece of clothes, yeah. whatever you wear that it becomes like your mm -hmm. cape or, you know, whatever the case may be. So like, for instance, I wear a ring that yeah. has a robot face on it. Uh, it is, it is arguably <laughs> the most <laughs> enjoyable thing I've ever purchased in my life. <laughs> And for me, the robot is a symbol of creation, of being able to create something, this, the, the notion of, of being man-made. Yeah. And there's an island in Tokyo called Odaiba, which is a man-made island. And on that island, they have this giant Gundam robot that actually articulates and talks. And yeah. it is insanely cool to me. Yeah. And the whole notion of just like what man can do, like when they learn the things they need to learn, they have the skills, the skills yeah. have utility, they put them to use, they create an island out of nothing yeah. and then put upon that island a gigantic robot, which also is man-made. It's just like there's something about the power of human ingenuity, of yeah. creation, of all that that I love. And then it's a fucking giant robot and I just yeah. like giant robots. And so I, I bought the ring. And I remember saying to my wife, Lisa, when I got it, I said, this is so silly and yet so powerful for me as like this incredible reminder. Yeah. And every time I feel its weight on my finger, I think about the grand ability for humans to create. Now, why is that important? I'm trying to build the next Disney. It is the most gigantic like undertaking that fits within my bailiwick. I will say that Elon trying to yeah. colonize Mars is a lot bigger, so I'm not saying it's the biggest ever, but in terms of like what I'm yeah. actually interested in, the skills that I want to acquire and all of that, it is it is a very big dream and it'll take me a very long time to execute against. Sure. And so having this totem, having something that I can put on, having this thing, and the funny thing is, literally, because I'm telling you this story and I'm allowing myself to get animated and yeah. I'm allowing it to fill me up, I'm further reinforcing 100%. what it means. And so tomorrow when I put the ring on, yeah. like it's actually going to mean more to me tomorrow than it did today because I'm reinforcing this notion, yeah. right? This is my grandma. I'm thinking about grandma. Yeah. I'm trying to honor grandma. I have this ritual of putting the ring on. And you should morning. be touching it more as you're doing it and putting it on, sliding it back and forth. Because for me, you know, to, to that like that's like that right there is amazing. Like that, I, I love that. Um, like for me, like starting out in business, 22, 21, looked like I was 12, maybe 10. <laughs> like I had a baby face and I was so insecure about what other people were thinking of me. How could I go on stages and now talk about mental game? I haven't won four awards. I haven't run, written three books. I'm not 43 years old. I don't have a, a tweed jacket with leather patches on my elbows, all that kind of stuff. But the reality was I was really freaking good at getting across these principles that had helped me because I'm not a physical specimen. I'm not six foot four, 240 pounds, but I played way bigger than my size was um, and definitely got as much out of myself as I could in order to, you know, perform how I did in athletics. But I was so insecure about how young I looked. And it was stopping me from making the phone calls, booking the workshops or, you know, getting clients, getting myself out there, whatever, whatever it was at the time. And, and I was like, wait a second, you used Geronimo as your alter ego on the football field. And I was like, why don't you use that, Todd? And I was like, wait a second, Cable. Geronimo was a little bit rough, doesn't quite work in business. So then I was like, well, you know, who, who or what am I really inspired by and would love to activate their qualities to help me get through this phase? And Benjamin Franklin, always loved Benjamin Franklin, Joseph Campbell, you know, one of my, one of my personal heroes and, and Superman, like, you know, uh, the 1980s, you know, Superman. And that was it. And I was like, okay. That's, I'm going to, and because I had this whole ritual that I'd go through when I was in the locker room to get ready for football games. I'm like, well, what's my, what's my thing? I didn't call it a totem at the time, but what's my object? Mm. And it was going to be glasses because I was going to do the reverse Clark Kent. You know, Superman put on glasses to become the mild mannered version of himself to be accepted by society and walk around. Um, but I was already mild mannered. I was already blending into the walls as oatmeal. I, I didn't want that. 
So uh, my glasses were going to activate that superhero self inside of myself. And so I went out and I bought a pair of non non-prescription glasses. And that's what I wore. And I'd put those on and I would practice putting them on and feeling more because I was, I lacked confidence. I was indecisive and um, I wasn't very articulate with, you know, what I was, what I had to offer. So I wanted to be confident, decisive, and articulate. That's who I wanted to be. And I knew that the people that were going to hire me, they wanted that too. Because anyone who's trying to hire someone who has an expertise in something, what they're actually hire, hiring is certainty and confidence and clarity. Those, like, when someone shows up and you're like, whew, like, I feel like if I had that guy on my mm. team or that woman on my team, we're going to make it happen. So I, you need to show up that way. And so I practiced putting those on, putting those on. My point about this was to getting to your whole, you know, when you put that on tomorrow, that trigger, it's just being embedded, that emotional charge that mm -hmm. you get. The act of this little arm sliding across here, because now I just wear glasses just for dress. I don't need right. them to, to, to step into that confidence articulate itself. Now I just use it for dress. Um, but even now when I do this, it's like a switch is getting flipped and I'm being very intentional because I want to be intentional. When I show up as a, whether it's a leader for my team or when I'm showing up on a, on a call where we're going to close uh, a new team to work with or a new client or something like that, like I want to show up as my absolute best heroic self mm. for that other individual because I'm deeply driven by service. It runs deep in my family. I want to serve. I know that's you as well. Like you want to serve and then you're going to leave this amazing legacy for this thing that you built. That's what's so I impressive. I believe about, the legacy. Yeah. Like that's what's so impressive about uh, Gaudi. He, Gaudi? Who's Gaudi? Gaudi, he started the construction of a church in the early 1900s, which based on his design was going to take 150 years to be built. The vision of that man to start working and laboring on something that he was personally never going to see the end of. People talk a lot about vision in business. He's the ultimate benchmark of vision. That is next level. I mean, it's still under construction outside of Barcelona, Spain, or in Barcelona. And, you know, it's one of the most amazing structures that's on our planet right now. So, you know, when you were doing that, I almost wanted to reach over and like, <laughs> except it's going to look really weird on camera <laughs> if I was doing that with you, but like, yeah, to like, no, yeah, 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 don't do that, Todd. That's a little bit too intimate. Um, but like, it's just like, yeah, play with that on there. Mm. Um, you know, yeah, it's interesting so. to me how it grows with power, like understanding how you can reinforce this stuff, how you can make it meaningful. Like yeah. there are so many, uh, this word is played out, but there's so many hacks and things that people can oh, do to, to <laughs> yeah. reinforce this stuff. And I think all too often people look at somebody who's successful and they think, well, lucky them, it must be nice. Yeah. Like, you know, they have this out or the other, they have the confidence, whatever, not realizing at some point you find a way, whether it's through physiological hooks, which that was a big one for me yeah. um, to lower my anxiety. So diaphragm breathing is a physiological hook into the parasympathetic nervous system known as rest and digest. So if you're wondering like, how the hell do I get out of this anxious over amp state? Sure. There is a physiological hook, which is as you breathe from your diaphragm, whether you want to or not, you're going to begin sliding into that state. Yeah. And then there are some things that you just have to decide. So you talked about decisiveness. Decisiveness yeah. is, um, intoxicating yeah. like when somebody has like they're just they're gonna do it they're convinced they can get yeah. other people on board like this is it that level of clarity is so intoxicating to people and when i do it for the team and they see it i can feel them galvanizing behind the idea and the thing is i'm honest with them i'm just fucking deciding i'm just saying like there yeah. are seven options before us i don't fucking know which one is going to work yeah but i'm not afraid to pick one yeah and go with all my gusto now i'm not going to pick one that's obviously bad yeah so i'm picking one that i think has a shot but what people allow themselves to do they allow themselves to be paralyzed they allow yeah. themselves to um accept from themselves that oh i don't know i'm not sure fuck that like yeah. my whole thing is being unsure you don't think i'm unsure yeah. you don't think i wonder well i wonder if this is going to work yeah but i've simply decided yeah to value decisiveness and once you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to value this thing, then I'm going to act in accordance with it, which yeah. means, okay, I'm looking at two options. I'm not entirely sure which one I'm going to go with a, maybe I'm going with a, because, um, I have a lighter ring on that hand. And so it just felt better to point yeah. towards the one who the fuck knows, but 
I'm going to go with that. I'm going to be all in. I'm going to do everything I can to make it work, but I'm going to constantly look and see, is it actually working? Yeah. If it's not working, then I'm going to switch. So now I've got this dual thing and my team knows one, I'm not afraid to pick. I'm going to move forward. I will accept the consequences yeah. and I'm not a dumbass. So if it's not working, yeah. I'm going to move. But like beginning, what, what I love about your message is people at some point, they have to take responsibility for who they want to become, right? Yes. Your Terry Grant quote. Yeah. It's who you want to become. It's not necessarily who you are today, yeah. but it is who you want to become. And at some point, you do have to take the first step into the unknown. You have to act, you have to act as if. Like you've got you've to put it out there. You've yeah. got to be decisive even when you're unsure. You've got to move forward. You've got to project confidence so that you can begin to really feel and internalize the confidence. You've got to have yeah. the physical thing, whether it's turning your talisman or having it in your pocket and rubbing yeah. it over. But understanding that whether it's the buck imagery, whether it's your robot ring, you have to infuse it with meaning. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that you said that Kobe knows more about the black mama than anybody else. It's like, that's how you infuse it with meaning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, talk, it, it, there's so many things to ping off with it. I want to go back to uh, when you said that when you put on your ring, you're like, and you said to your wife, like, this is going to be silly. There's actually... I mean, we're having a, a serious conversation with deep and meaningful things that we hope that at least one person that's listening or watching is going to like make a paradigm shift and just all of a sudden a new world's going to show up for them. But one thing I want to reinforce with people is one of the great powers of this idea or one of the great powers that human beings have is playfulness. The thing I love about this idea and I could see with people is I could see stress and anxiety melt away when they started to get engaged with the idea and see how playful it is to know that this is your, again, I, I am, I am the, the person standing out in front of other people talking about the power of alter egos. I don't care that people know that the glasses that I wear are not real. <laughs> like it just wear them for dress. I don't care about that because I'm, I'll use them as a signal and a totem to tell other people that I don't care. But you do know that I am being very intentional about I want to bring my best self so I can serve you in this moment. That's why they're there. But it's that when I could when I could see someone really understand that this is them being playful. It's like you don't even know that I'm showing up as Batman in this moment when I'm in the boardroom right now. Like that playful idea because playfulness, the whole reason that I'm doing this is because I'm, I want to get my clients, the people that buy our training programs and whatnot to get to that zone and flow state, that zone and flow state where every capability that you have comes flowing out of you unhindered by the resistance that, or the judgment or the self-talk that typically slows you down. That's the reason that we do this. Playfulness is the key that unlocks the back door to peak performance. And we're walking through the doorway of our creative imagination to make that happen. That is our superpower. The, you know, the best genre of movies right now, superhero movies, that Marvel comic, that DC comic world that's out there. Why? Because there's this natural hero's journey narrative that we latch onto with it. Also, we love the fantasy idea in our mind of like, what would I have if I had a superpower, you know? But we forget when we do, human beings do. We're the only living thing on this planet with this one ability. It's not love. It's not affection. Am I saying that they're not powerful? A hundred percent they are. But nothing else on this planet has creative imagination. Nothing else on this planet can choose to, in the moment, decide to be someone or something else. Can make, you know, a heaven from hell or a hell from heaven. We have that ability. You've got two people, the same experience is happening to them. One chooses a completely different path and they, you know, strive and they thrive. Another one gets crippled by it. That's fascinating to me. That's fascinating that we can do that, that our creative imagination builds story and narrative in our own minds. Yeah, that, that's crazy. Have you read The Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela? No, I haven't. Oh, yet. dude, fucking yeah. read that book. It's yeah. crazy. So I read Joseph Campbell. When I was, I must have been in my late teens, early 20s, mm -hmm. something like that. And he talked about how, you know, rituals really lost. And he thought that that was a big part of why adolescence had become stunted. Like there was yeah. no grand moment where you knew like, hey, you're different. And he was like, there were societies that used to take teenagers out into the woods and they would literally kick their teeth in. Yeah. Um, you had people that would... 
um, you know, circumcise adults yeah. with no anesthetic or not adults, but you know, a, yeah. a 13 year old. And you, you went through something hard. And by going through that thing, like you knew, okay, on the other side of this, I'm a different person. Yeah. And so in long walk to freedom, Nelson Mandela was one of the last, um, uh, generations that went through this thing and they took three or four boys at once that were all, I think 13 and they have them sit down with their legs splayed and, uh, like elder comes along with a really sharp rock and the kids are sitting there buck naked yeah. in front of the whole tribe. Yeah. And the guy comes up, grabs their foreskin and just cuts it off with the rock. And then they have to yell. I think they have to throw their arm up and yell this warriors like Creed. statement. Yeah. Yeah. Statement. yeah. And, I just thought, whoa, like in that moment, yeah, you know, like because the moment is imbued with so much meaning and there are people there and it is ritualistic. Visceral. It's like, yeah, a thousand oh, yeah. percent. Like once you're on the other side of that, you really do like something kicks in mm -hmm. and makes you feel differently. And so when I got married, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to be ritualistically scarred. Yeah. And so because I wanted to be a different person before and a different person after. And so um, I ended up getting tattooed. It's the only tattoo that I have. Yeah. And I wanted something that was painful. And at the time, I was just absolutely terrified of needles. Yeah. So doing something that was facing this gigantic fear that I knew was going to be painful and that was going to leave a permanent scar on my body, it like carried all this weight and this emotion for me. But it goes back to that notion of what is it imbued with? Mm -hmm. And so really being conscious of grabbing a hold of that narrative, understanding yeah. what that narrative is, understanding that humans are meaning making machines. Yes. That's what we do Huge. all day long. And when you can, take a hold of that in your own life. Like yeah. you don't have to wait for, nobody no. told me to get the tattoo, totally. right? So it was just in your own life, where's an area where you can apply a different meaning, a new meaning, a more powerful meaning to what you're doing yeah. that's going to give you that direction and purpose that's going to allow you to step into your inner superhero or yeah. whatever, but it's going to give new meaning to what you're doing, which elevates it importance, which gives it a lasting impact, which then gives it the ability to sort of pull you through diff difficult times, times where maybe you're indecisive or times yeah. where you're feeling weak or whatever. You've got this thing to fall back on, that mm -hmm. narrative. And do you know um, Yuval Noah Harari? Yes. Oh, man. So as you yeah. know, like his work around humans and narrative yeah. and the way that societies are organized around those narratives uh, it's, it's really pretty extraordinary. Well, and, and that gets to my point. Like when I was talking about the whole, you know, when you build out that identity model at that core driver's layer, that societal narrative that sits there, you know, people don't realize that it can be a dome or a glass ceiling that they don't even realize is, is stopping them until Give me an example of a time where it holds somebody back. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, there is a client, just I'll use an example of a client in, in New York, uh, a Jewish woman who you know, grew up in, in an environment where in, in her particular kind of tribe, uh, the female shouldn't be making as much money as the male counterparts, okay? It's not even just the Jewish community. It's pervasive in mm -hmm. you know, other white communities and, and Catholic and Christian communities. So, but, and it was, but, sh but again, the, that's why I say like in the book, I talk about the two selves. There's the trapped self, which ends up happening when you have this outside in pressure that, you know, when you're trying to worry about other people and, and you feel trapped because you know that all of you isn't getting out there somehow. Uh, and then there's the other side, which is this heroic self. And the heroic self isn't that you're a hero, but you feel heroic in the moment because whether or not you got the result that you're looking for, you acted the way that you wanted to. You know, whether it was that, whether it was you in a moment sticking up for a friend who someone else was, you know, you know, lobbing insults at and you got in there and you, you know, is you taking a stand saying, you know, you don't do that or whatever your response is in that moment, or you raising your hand in a, in a meeting and you, you know, voicing your concern when typically you would stay trapped because you don't want to say something in front of your boss, you know, that feels heroic to you. Mm. So, um, so for her, for her, she had this huge aspiration and desire to continuously grow her business, but she was stunting it because if she did, if she made even a thousand dollars more, she was going to surpass her husband. And um, 
And she was making all these assumptions without even talking to her husband. Was she unaware of it or did she know? She was unaware. Ooh, of it. I don't want to. She was unaware that that was, that that was actually the thing. She was, she was, you know, using other things as the reasons why her business wasn't growing. I can't find the right customers, Todd. Mm. I don't think my marketing's really working right now. What was it that she said or did that got you to that realization? Uh, so this is where just the experience that I have of knowing that, you know, there's a lot of things that are hidden from people that mm -hmm. they don't realize. Me knowing that she's... What do you look for, though? Are you looking at body language? Are you looking at word choice? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking like... at the whole... I'm looking at the identity of the person. So she's a, a Jewish woman. Um, I know kind of the, the group that she, you know, lives inside of. So right away, be, that's why it's so important for us, I think, for people to help make change that I need to consume as much as I possibly can around cultural narratives. Like, you know, I've, I've worked in 86 countries around the world. Whoa. Like not by phone, traveled to Kazakhstan. I've, been, I've worked in every Astan that there is, Tajikistan, <laughs> Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Like, you know, so I've been, and it's, and when you and when you work inside those cultures, it's very different than traveling there as a tourist. Mm -hmm. We get to work inside, then you get to really see how they're, you know, coexisting and whatnot. So it's important for me to just really dive deep into all these different, you know, worlds that are different from mine, mm -hmm. so that I can pick up on them far more quickly. So I can, you know, because I want to be known as someone who can make change happen fast. A lot of people don't want that because it places an expectation on you. I want the expectation. I'm a tiger. I want to hunt that down. I want to get the kill for you faster than someone else. You know, I, I want that moniker placed on me. A lot of people don't want it. No, I want it. And that's what winners do. Winners want that. Winners want that final play that's drawn up with two and a half seconds left and the coach saying, you're getting the ball. I want the ball. And everyone that's watching this and listening to this, they should want the ball too. The moment that you make the decision that you want the ball, all bets are off. Boy, like I get chills. I'm right now. I got chills because oh it's amazing when someone makes that shift. Like you were talking about with decision, when you when you decide. Now we use the again. It's a platitude. We say, you know, like man, you just when you decide to take responsibility for your life. Hey, that's wonderful. So those are those are great platitudes. Me, I want meat and potatoes. I want to give you something that helps you truly embody that. And for me, it's I get I get right now that you can't see yourself making that change. But what I do know is you have the capacity and abilities gifted with you as a human being to start acting to and through some other identity, someone else that you're inspired by. And whether you use glasses to activate that, whether you use a robot ring, whether you use a picture of your grandma on the table, whether you use a Wonder Woman bracelet like one of my equestrian clients uses when she activates Wonder Woman, when she gets on that horse, think about that as a sport. It's the only sport where you have another animal that most beautifully transmutes your emotional state to everyone else. Yeah, talk to me about that. So horses are fucking weird, man. So how is it that they're picking up on so much human emotion? Well, it's, who knows? I am not the expert on definitely all things emotional around horses, but they have this phenomenal capacity to detect your energy field. That's why they're used in you know, so many different types of therapy, whether it's around autism or whether it's around, you know, uh, helping people overcome PTSD and trauma. They're, they're just these walking caretakers. They're phenomenal. Like, you know, I grew up on a big ranch. I had, you know, three horses of my own, Cracker Jack, Socks, and Midnight. And, um, you know, the, the lesson that my father gave me early on was if you're ever out on the farm in the ranch and you get lost, just ask them to go back home. And, and that's the, that's the thing. If you're ever lost in the wilderness and you happen to have a horse with you, follow the horse. The horse will take you back to wow. some place and something or someone. And, uh, but, you know, getting back to, to my client, she was someone who was a type A personality, ran her own business and um, ran, kind of operated in novice competitions. Uh, in the, in the category of dressage. So it's basically like, you know, intricate, you know, you're doing intricate moves out on uh, in this arena where every single little subtle movement on your part and the horse's part is being graded, right? So you got people watching you and judging you. Well, that's already going to trigger some anxiety in people. So if you're getting on this horse that beautifully transmutes your emotional state and you're someone who's anxious, now the horse is anxious. It's not going to hit its mark. 
And so when talking to uh, my client and I asked her, I'm like, okay, get it. Lisa, you're anxious. But what I do know is there is a version of you right now that isn't anxious. Now, who could we use to activate that non-anxious person? Now, who do you look at that you admire the way that they show up? And immediately it was Linda Carter. Linda Carter's version of Wonder Woman. Because this is before the new Wonder Woman movie that came out. Right. This is several years ago. And I said, well, why? What is it about Linda? Like, and I mean, I do it in a way where I want to challenge people like, eh, that sounds cliche. <laughs> That's boring or whatever. Because I want them to sell me on it. Right. Because again, I want that emotional charge happening inside of them. So why Linda Carter? Because she stands her ground no matter what's happening around her. She owns the space that she's in. It doesn't matter. She moves forward all the time. She never retreats. But she just, it's this. And I didn't need her because words are clumsy for us. And I was like, all I care about is that I see that there's an emotional state change for her. Hmm. That she gets it on the inside. I'm like, I just, I'm like, I get it. Say no more. Because I don't want her to talk herself out of it either. Right. So that was it. So we went out and that was the ritual now. Before she got on the horse, she would snap. And, I'm, and I tell her, make sure that the clasp that you get, because she made a custom-made bracelet, um, make sure that that clasp is like, it makes a sound. Mm. Because sound is a phenomenal trigger to the human brain. Like, um, and so when you hear that snap, boom, that's when Wonder Woman takes over. But you got to honor her. Because Linda Carter would never, ever go out on that horse and not own that routine, own sitting on top of that horse and let your horse know that you you got this. Mm. Make it relax and confident in the routine. Her trainer is uh, the world's top dressage trainer. He's got a barn out in Connecticut. He's got the most world champions that train out of his barn. He called me up 10 months into us working together and, uh, and, and my client asked if he was okay with the connected. I said, yeah, absolutely. And he said, Todd, I gotta say, I don't get, I don't get this. I don't get how this person who is always kind of in the average is now winning the championships around the world. It doesn't make sense that someone can ascend that quickly. And I was like, nothing about the human being, about human beings makes sense. But, you know, our jobs as people who coach and train and mentor and advise other people is to make sure that we don't look at someone as someone we need to fix. Is that we don't need to tell them that there's something outside of them that they need to go and get or acquire in order for them to be better, be whole or whatever. I treat you like everything that you've got in order to be successful right now is already there. It's just under a bunch of muck and mire, a bunch of dust. It's under a bunch of story, a bunch of narrative that if we cut those strings, those puppet strings, those invisible strings that are stopping you or preventing you or making you behave in a certain way, that all of a sudden this, this possibility, this new possibility comes out of you. And anyway, you know, he was just, so I explained to him like the process of how I was working with her and what we were actually mm -hmm. doing behind the scenes. And so I said, you know, it's not, you know, Sarah up on that horse. That's, that's Wonder Woman up on that horse. And she owns that. She 100% owns it. That that's who's up there competing is Wonder Woman. And she loves that playful idea in her mind that no one knows that Linda Carter and Wonder Woman are up there competing. It looks like Sarah, but it's not. Talk to me about Olympians and pressure. This is something that I think a lot about, like the amount that's on the line for somebody yeah. to make a mistake, a tenth of a second, the difference between $10 yeah. million dollars in endorsements and a life of absolute obscurity. Mm -hmm. How do the best of the best deal with that? Yeah. So pressure is an interesting thing. I don't let the idea of pressure live inside of my universe. It's not gravity in this world. Pressure is, everyone talks about it as if it's real. And it's not. Pressure is something that you are somehow applying to yourself based on the moment and the story that you're wrapping up. So like, we can't have one without the other. Like, we can't talk about how story and narrative is what human beings do. And then we can't talk about how maybe something doesn't exist. Maybe pressure doesn't exist. Because pressure is what? Meaning that you're attaching to an event. Mm. What if we were so deliberate and intentional about the meaning that we were always attaching to events that it didn't create pressure for ourselves, but it created something else. Now, I'm not saying pressure doesn't exist for other people. 100% it does. But it was, the, it was their creation, not my creation. But yes, there are moments that can be filled with 
stress and anxiety if you allow them to. Like if when I have a skier who is pointing their tips down the face of a slope that looks like a cliff <laughs> and it's filled with ice, basically, based on the amount of athletes that already went in front of them. And they've got to make tight turns around flags. And the only thing stopping them is some orange plastic netting that's running along the sign. If you do not have 100% complete and utter trust, mm. trust is the key. That's what we're pursuing. Trust. When you trust yourself, when you trust your preparation, when you trust your routines, that's when you now opened up the doorway for a personal best to happen. But the only way that we can get there is through us focusing on the process all the way down the hill. The greatest example of someone in the, in the final moment of a competition, losing their focus on what they were doing and seeing if they won was the great race between Michael Phelps and I think it was the Czech swimmer at the, uh, at the Beijing Games when he was beating Phelps throughout the entire race, dominating. And in the last, uh, last lap, Phelps is making a comeback, making a comeback, making a comeback. And it's going to be like a photo finish at the end. And they both come to the wall. The guy is in front of Phelps. And as he's coming to reach towards the wall, he immediately pops his head up before he's hit the wall. And when you pop your head up, what happens? Shoulders come back. When your shoulders come back, well, your arms are attached to your shoulders. So what do they do? They come back too. And Phelps drove through the wall. And he beat him by... I think it's two hundredths of a second. Wow. That's the difference to your point about someone who gets the gold and someone who gets the silver, mm. who wins and someone who, who loses in that instant. I thought so it was, right. and I use that example all the time and I play the video in, in different presentations of just like, and, I, and my point about it is the difference of to and through. Cause I love just getting people to think about words. Well, what would you tell that guy? Like, how do you rebuild that guy? The guy that loses that story is interesting to me. Do you yeah. know anything about him? Like where 100%. is he at now? What's he doing? Yeah. How does he think of himself? Oh, he how can does he continue think of to loss? compete and continue to compete at a high level. Okay. But it's like, you know, you, you, you lost that race. That version of you lost that race. So like, I'm always playing It's like, you know, so We've got, a, we've, got a, we've got an opportunity and a decision right now that you get to make is, is the current version of you that just lost that race because you did that. Mm. Like that's the you that showed up. You lost that race. Are you going to carry that identity forward or are you going to take that? Because there's winners, there's losers, and there's learners. Which one are you going to be? Yeah, man. Like, look, I'm, I am so with you. I totally agree. That's how I process life 1,000%. When I see stuff like that happen, it sounds like this guy's okay. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. But man, so many people end up allowing that loss to become the defining moment of their life. Yeah. That shit is scary. I had Nastia Lukin on Impact mm. Theory, and she was, I think it was a qualifying round for the Olympics, and she does a move and literally misses the bar and just yeah. smacks flat. And the thing I found so interesting about her was that that was what everybody was trying to make her story. Yes. But she didn't. Like, yeah. she didn't make it her story. She was able to learn from it and move on. I'm sure she was absolutely devastated. But she just sort of picked herself up, brushed herself off, finished the routine, got yeah. back up on the bars. No, there's no way to win now. Yeah, yeah. But she got back up on the bars, finished the routine. And so it was like there was something about being consistent with who she wanted to be, even yes. though she lost. Yeah. That was like a bigger narrative than the falling narrative. Yeah. Well, but again, this gets back to the problem that we have. Again, those, those of us that will operate at an elite level. We just, we operate in a completely different set of rules than what the rest of society continuously uh, perpetuates with the narratives of winning and losing or lost. Yeah, so the, the average folk out there are gonna look at that and say, she lost. But, but that's not really how we process things at the elite level because there's practice, there's, there's process, there's, there's next. Like none of these things define you. If you want to allow all of the wins and losses to define you, then you're operating from an outcome oriented 
perspective. The best of the best stay very much internal. They're very much process oriented. You know, Jerry Rice, great example. Like I was at a training session with Jerry Rice when he retired and there was young 22, 23 year olds that were about to do the Jerry Rice famous uh, practice. Mm. None of them lasted. He was retired and in some cases 25 years older than the other kids and they didn't last. Mm. I've and, heard about his workouts being just absolutely legendary. Yeah, and, and his just mindset was like, you know, to everyone else, you don't have what it takes. You, you can't, you was can't he, be Jerry. Was he somebody like um, Kobe where it was like, I need you to understand I'm going to outwork you? Yes. That yeah. was part of his shtick. Big time. I mean, you know, the, uh, you know, if there was a knock against Jerry, Jerry wasn't a team guy. He's not like a locker room guy. He's not someone that you can like laugh and joke around and have fun with. I mean, Deion Sanders talks about it quite a bit. You know, they didn't really get along when he was at the, at the right. 49ers. But, you know, if you're looking at just pure excellence on the field of play, you know, Jerry, Jerry put in, Jerry put in the work. Yeah. But, but I do, I want to get back to that, uh, that narrative that is just pervasive and it's so frustrating for me because I see so many people, you know, they, they consume media or they listen to the prognosticators on television when they're talking about sport and, and just 90% of the time, that's not actually what any of the athletes are ever thinking. It's, it's like even what people don't get is getting to the Olympics is the win. Mm. You are an you're not an Olympian. You're, you're, you're always an Olympian. When you meet someone who is at the 1972 Olympics, you refer to them as an Olympian. It's present tense always. You will always be an Olympian. Okay. And so, but in order to draw viewers' eyeballs in, you've got to create stories around, you know, Nastia Lukin's uh, process of how she got there and the story of where she came from or Simone Biles or Michael Phelps or insert the name of anyone in anything. But the reality is like, we're there to create personal best. And if your personal best is good enough to get you on the podium, amazing. But truly the athlete who goes there with the intention of just winning the medals, the their, their focus is on the wrong thing. And it sounds completely counterproductive to what everyone keeps on saying about how winners think, you know, like, you know, the Vince Lombardi uh, quote of, um, now it just left my, left my mind, but it's his famous quote around, um, you know, winning. Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Well, it's taken out of context. There's actually a, a larger quote that's there. Do um, you remember it? Because I would love to... Yeah, it's, it. I'm... I'm I'm failing with my well. While you think about while you think of it, um, what's interesting to me is I think it probably has more to do with your perspective going into it. So if your perspective going in is I've got a shot at the gold, and you walk away in fifth place, something tells me that that is going to be utterly heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But if you think you're going to be in ninth place and you end up in fifth place, then it's going to be like, oh my god, the greatest thing. And for the rest of your life, when yeah. somebody calls you an Olympian, it's like, hey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did great. So some of this, I think, you know, the, there are so many stories of triumph and so many stories of just devastating loss that are yeah. tied to the Olympics. And if I had to guess, you could do a pretty powerful expose on people who were ruined by yeah. the Olympics, just emotionally, that they never recover. Yeah. And obviously it comes down to the story. It comes down to the values that they have around winning. It comes down to the messy reality of what were their parents saying? Were they pushing them from an early age? Yeah. Did, did they accidentally allow themselves or, or forcefully in, you know, when you get, get some of these young gymnasts where a parent is saying you're only valuable if you're winning mm -hmm. and it becomes such an ingrained part of who you are. Like you are destined to win. Getting a gold is why you exist. It's yeah. why you've spent 10 years training this just ungodly pace, giving up your childhood. And when it doesn't pan out, it's like, Man, at some point, like that shit is going to be really hard to get over. And this is yeah. the same thing happens in business where people like a win is the only reason you're doing it. Mm -hmm. You're doing it so that you can get the money. Mm -hmm. And trust me, as somebody who spent almost a decade doing that, I fully understand. But yeah, the money's not guaranteed. The struggle is. And so if you aren't able to really love the struggle, to get into it, yeah, to yeah. push yourself, to, yeah. to have an identity that's around something other than the victory itself. Like one thing people should check themselves against is, does the, the thing that I love, 
can it be aimed at something else or is it the thing itself? So for instance, I was just at Tony Gonzalez's house, one of the greatest football players of all time, just inducted into the hall of fame. Fucking super interesting guy. Love that guy to death. Such a good dude. Yeah. And part of his struggle was that what he was doing was aimed at the thing. It was aimed at being a football player. And for like three years after he finished playing, he slid into a depression because he didn't know who he was without football. Exactly. And I thought, wow. If on the other hand, like, because what he he actually did something very interesting when he was in college. I think he was far more interested in basketball, basketball. than he was football. Yeah. But for whatever reason, something happened, and is in his words, basketball was taken from me. I I'm, I don't remember what happened, but yeah. he ends up getting into football, and he goes through this process of realizing I can fall in love with football. I can actually fall in love with this the way that I fell in love with basketball. I can because yeah. he said I used to love the smell of the basketball, the yeah. way it smelled on my hands, like dribbling the ball everywhere, just like everything. I was obsessed with it. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's so interesting that you could make the transition from basketball to football and you found a way to fall in love with football. Because he said for years in football, he didn't love it. Yeah. And it wasn't until he thought, wait a second, all the things that allowed me to love basketball and fall in love with it and be obsessed and all of that, I could translate that over into football. Yeah. And But when he got out, he didn't do the same thing with broadcasting. And so mm-hmm. for the first few years that he was broadcasting, he said, I didn't love it. And it's only now that I'm realizing, wait a second, this is like a pattern. And if I can find a way to love it, sure, then you know I can really enjoy this yeah. next phase of my life. Yeah. But my heartbreak for people is you've you're never able to build a belief system, a value structure, identity that's bigger than the way it made you feel when you thought you were gonna get the gold, when mm-hmm. you thought you were gonna win, when you thought you were gonna be valedictorian, when you thought, in my own case, you yeah. thought you were gonna be the next Spielberg, right? Like all these yeah. things. And then what do you do when that's not how things play out? Mm-hmm. Like, do you go in a dark place? Like, do you become obsessed with who you could have been are you given the on the waterfront speech i could have been a contender like is that where you go or do you find a way to say okay hold on i recognize this is a value system i can no longer value those things like i thought a lot about like what would happen if i'm building impact theory and it doesn't fail to get off the ground worse it really starts to go somewhere Mm -hmm. and then it implodes. Mm. Like, what does my life look like then? How do I respond to that? Now, the good news for me is that I don't allow, even though, uh, trust me, like a a black hole's worth of center of gravity, like it is so tempting. It's so easy to just slip into that notion to be, I am what I've accomplished. Yeah, yeah. But when you have a narrative that you're telling yourself that is something different that keeps you from being sucked into that black hole that you're reminding yourself of constantly, yeah. which for me, it's I'm the learner, I'm the learner, I'm the learner. And as long as I love what I'm doing, then I'm going to keep doing it. And the second that I don't, I'll happily change direction. That's a core part of who I am and what I tell myself and what I tell the people around me. And so I'm reinforcing it as I articulate yeah. it out loud. Like doing all of that gives you some protection from that. But I get like there is something about the human condition that makes that neurologically very difficult to fail publicly, to fail at something that you've been moving towards your whole life that you gave yourself over to. You allowed yourself to say, I'm going to win a gold medal. Yeah. And then poof, it's gone. Yeah. Well, to your conversation around Tony, I mean, that's I mean, that's that was that was a it became later in my career. But that's that was like a bread and butter was like helping athletes transition out of you know, what that next phase was going to be mm-hmm. because for the longest time we are described as a football player or, you know, in the book at, in, at the beginning of chapter three, I talk about the, the tennis player who won, won the collegiate championship, um, but just fundamentally burned out of tennis because uh, when he was losing, he felt like he was failing as a human being because everything, all of his identity was wrapped up in mm-hmm. being a tennis player. And that's why I'm, uh, the message is so important for me because I want people to have a, a way healthier mental health for themselves is seeing that, no, you're many identities. And when you, and when you realize that you're, there's many roles that you're playing in life, you, we can start to separate these things so that when you've got one role that might not be going well for you right now, entrepreneurship, you're not failing as a human being. And you know, you're struggling right now in it. But that doesn't mean you need to go and fail at being a father, fail at being a husband, 
and all these things. It's super interesting. Do you know Robert Sapolsky? No. A professor at Stanford. This guy's fucking interesting. Go watch every YouTube video he's ever done. This guy's so incredible. So he researched baboons for like 20 years or something. Mm -hmm. And he said the baboons are, they, they will chill you to your core with how much human behavior you will recognize in them. Yeah. And the baboon troop that he followed, they were a very successful troop. They only had to work about three hours a day to get their food. So they had something like eight hours worth of daylight mm -hmm. where they could just, as he said, be really shitty to each other. Yeah. And he said they would just like develop these crazy hierarchies and where you fell in the hierarchy. If it wasn't a stable hierarchy, meaning from one day to the next, you didn't know who you were above, who you were below. And th there was like constant fighting over it. He said their stress levels were absolutely insane. Mm. And, you know, I can't remember if he said they actually die of stress related disease, but he said they would dart them and then check their levels. And he said it was crazy. They're just like, yeah. um, their immune systems were really suppressed because they had so much stress and anxiety over where, where yeah. they fell in the hierarchy. And he said, you see the exact same thing in humans with one fascinating exception. Humans have multiple hierarchies. So if you hate your fucking job you're, and you're low man on the totem pole at work, but you're the deacon of your church, he said, those people are going to tell you all day long how the, you know, working from nine to five is total bullshit. You're just being taken advantage of. It's yeah. garbage. But if you were the deacon of the church, then it was like, oh, you had all these amazing things to say about being a deacon at the church. I thought, fuck, I never thought of that before. Yeah. The way that we're always looking to say, okay, much like we have different identities, we belong to different, different competence hierarchies. Yeah. And based on what one feels good, we're going to put all of our time and energy into that basket. When you think about like nerds now take on a different context, but when we were growing up in yeah. the 80s, being a nerd was not cool. But within its own ecosystem, yes. it actually was. So like I was a band nerd. But within band, like then there's a whole different pecking order. And so the rest of the world may think yeah. that you're, you know, super lame. But yeah. in the band, it's like, hey, I'm doing all right. Yeah. It's really interesting. And there's something about actually having the awareness of, hey, if things aren't going well in one or multiple areas, finding an area where you can shine yeah. and going engaging in that could have an immeasurably powerful impact on your overall well-being. Yeah. And one thing that Sapolsky said is the key thing to understand is that you would think if I described to you the effects of being low in a hierarchy that you would want to be a high-ranking um, high ranking baboon within the, the yeah. group. But he said that actually isn't the thing that has the most well-being. What has the most well-being is somebody that's in a stable hierarchy, regardless of where they are, and they have the most um, social relationships. And when you're in a stable hierarchy, even if you're low, but you have a lot of social contacts, yeah. then that actually has a greater impact on your well-being than just being high ranking. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up too, because you brought up the social relationship side of things. And when you, and when you look at any of the, the, the long-term studies that have been done on the quality of lives of people that when they get to the end of their lives, uh, and and they and they've had uh, whether it's a lot of success or they grade themselves as having a successful life or what have you. There's really only one uh, out of all the different studies. There's only really one consistent theme amongst the people that have had both a successful life, had a high quality of life, and you know are are living what would be considered a, a joyful experience. And that is the quality of their relationships. Yeah. Right. And, and so I want to bring that up because we're talking, we're talking so much about someone making change happen and, and shifting and, and doing the work or whatever. But I think the great mistake, I did this early on and, uh, I am a huge byproduct of mentorship, apprenticeship. It's one thing that's massively lost nowadays is everyone's trying to race to the finish line of success so that they can have some sort of status and label on themselves as opposed to just going in and tucking yourself underneath the wing of someone who's doing the work that you want to go and do. Like there's a reason why the Renaissance is still graded as the greatest history in art history and it was built off of apprenticeship you know, with Michelangelo and Leonardo and Da Vinci, like all of these other. amazing names were within 10 years of each other. Mm. Um, Do you know that those two hated each other? No, I didn't. Yeah, oh, it's fucking fascinating. The doc, or documentary, the biography that Walter Isaacson wrote about oh, yeah. 
Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. He goes into that and how everybody fucking hated Michelangelo. And I guess he had a deformed nose mm. because he was such a dick that someone just walked up and fucking smashed really? him in the face. <laughs> That's amazing. And yeah, his his nose then healed funny. Weird. And, yeah. and that was it. And he was like a total loner. Nobody wanted to be around him. But fuck, what a genius. Yeah. But you're, yeah. Dude, I was going to nod. I thought my head was going to fall off. I was nodding so hard. I so agree. My whole thing with... I love social media. I think it's actually super powerful. It is very dangerous and it's a bit like a gun. And yeah. if you use it inappropriately, you're going to fucking kill yourself. Yeah. But if you know how to use it, it can be an incredible tool. And one of the things that makes me very sad about social media, despite it being so incredibly powerful, is people want to be heard instead of getting good. And so I'll get good. people like I, I meet people every now and then and, and shout out to my boy at Avra here in Beverly Hills who I met uh, and he was like, dude, I love the show. I watch it all the time. And I had this when I meet people like that out in the wild who are into the show, I'm like, fuck, OK, I have like 30 seconds with this person. I want to change their life. Right. Going back to what you said <laughs> yeah. earlier, I want the six fucking words that are like going to change this person forever. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, it all starts with your goals. What are your goals? And he was like, I want to make videos that inspire people. And I was like, God damn it. I'm like, here's how you end up making videos that inspire people. You go get good at something. Mm. Because here's the truth. If you're just trying to parrot back all yes. the things that you've heard from people that have gone and got extraordinary or something, you're, it, it just won't. It won't have the richness because it's, here's it's what, lacking the nuance. It, got, it has no depth. You you have learned things that I have not learned. In your experience, you fought and struggled yeah. and all that. And sort of on paper, you could probably describe us as, you know, they essentially went through the same thing, right? Trying to achieve yeah. greatness in a field and all yeah. that coming out of nowhere, blah, blah, blah. And it's like in going through that process, things occurred to you that didn't occur to me mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. And so that's what makes it interesting i'm like until you've gone out into the wilderness and done your thing there's yeah. like nothing to bring back to the tribe yeah so it's like don't the videos are going to take care of themselves either you're going to get extraordinary at something and really learn some shit and then people are really going to want to listen to you yeah or you're not like yeah. there are people out there that aren't necessarily super charismatic or dynamic but god damn it they've learned something mm -hmm. And I want to listen to those motherfuckers all day because it's like, whoa, yeah. you've got some insights into things I've never thought of, man. Yeah. And what you've done, in fact, this is it. When somebody writes a book or creates a video, what they're trying to do is distill down everything they've learned over the last 20, 30 years yeah. and make it digestible for you. If they haven't done anything for the last 20 or 30 years, they have nothing to digest or give you to digest. It's like, which is a bananas. lot of books, though. There's a lot of books. That's my problem with the leadership, personal and self-help space is, you know, there's a recipe. How do you gain authority, gain influence? You write a book. And right. so someone who's a year and a half, two years in, because now it's a hell of a lot easier to write books with the amount of like writing services that are out there and ghostwriters and this and that. And so you've got people who read like the three contemporary or, you know, uh, or past bestsellers on the topic. And then they're going to go and iterate on it and uh and give their viewpoint and it's just and people start propagating and permeating these same ideas and when you actually look at a lot that's why i've got such an issue with the industry is because there are very few books that have become mainstream that are written by practitioners, mm. the ones that have done the work. And I'm not even talking researchers because standing on the sidelines and seeing how a football player is approaching their career or approaching and you take down your notes and maybe you do a couple of interviews is way different than the person who's been working with thousands of them one-on-one right. -on -one and seeing, well, what they say in the press conference and what they actually do behind the scenes are two very different things. The alter ego stuff, this is the thing that people actually do to help go and achieve amazing things. It's never been articulated because it's a private experience that people don't go and talk about. Right. Beyonce was rare in that she let it out and told people. What people don't understand is she was crucified on blogs and many other things by whether it's evangelical right or even the, the African-American community about being inauthentic and why would she even need to go and do that? Couldn't she just be herself? Listen, I get it. Beautiful idea. Be yourself, gang. How's that fucking working for you? It's not. Like enough with all these shitty platitudes that don't mean anything. Like inauthentic, inauthenticity. What a shitty term. 
Like I'm sick and tired of authenticity, authentic self. A, there's no such thing as the authentic self because there is no self. There is no you, right? Like I was with you right till then. No, there's. So I there, think there is something about there's a I'll uh, I'll call it the integrated self, right? Where there's definitely like even my robot thing. Okay, my mm -hmm. robot thing. While it's not quite an uh, an alter ego, it's but it's a totem and it reminds yeah. me of something. It's it's very real and very true to myself, even though I built in the meaning to that. Mm -hmm. So like when you were giving me the Linda Carter thing, I thought, you know, it's actually really interesting as people, people are revealing themselves in the thing that they choose. Yes. So there is still to me, authenticity, I guess, is, is, is like a trigger for me because I really, I, I feel very grossed out when other people I can tell you're you're pandering you're presenting something that isn't real yeah and so I think that being who you are is is the only way to build a strong sense of self okay that didn't work let me explain it another way it, the second I start trying to act like I know something that I don't, I mm. get anxious. Yeah. And so anxiety has become this amazing invisible fence that keeps me authentic. And when I was younger, I was prone to like trying to, you know, flex my muscles and like yeah, yeah. be a little bit bigger than I really yeah. was. And it made me feel gross. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so once I stopped doing that and I was like, this is where I'm actually at. This is what I actually understand. This is what I don't understand. I try to call out like when I start like because there are things, ideas I'm excited about, but I don't really understand yet. Yeah. And so I'll try to flag them as like, fuck, this is so interesting to me. But I'm now at the edge of what I understand and I'm just sort of yeah. talking. But being true to who you are, like even this show. So I'd real... Um, not hesitation about doing the show, but the thing about doing this show in particular was on impact theory, if I disagree with you, then I'm just going to be quiet. I'm going to let you say your piece and maybe it resonates with somebody else. Yeah. And, and that's that. But on this, I was like, if I don't agree, I'm going to tell somebody I don't agree yeah. because I want to, I want, I want to evolve my own thinking in real time. And I can't, if I'm just silent, I have to push yeah. you and then you push me back. And yeah. Like we see where we settle out. So I think that there. I have a deep desire to be true to myself. I love the word authentic. I don't have the same reaction that you do. Yeah. I think there is an authentic self that is a real thing, but I also completely buy into alter ego. Yeah, so like when I say, when I'm talking about that, it's like, it's again, understanding that we've got many identities that we have. So, you know, if I'm perceived by other people as being a challenger personality, which is very easy. I mean, it's, of course, I'm working with, you know, ambitious people or achievers and, you know, they're coming to me to get a specific skill set or a paradigm shift or something. And I need to like, sometimes you got to take the battering ram approach and you got to crack through it and you got to be tough with them. Oh, plus, God, I'd fucking I, love to watch that. Plus, I've got really big personalities coming my way. Like, you know, I'm working with the people that you're seeing on ESPN or Sky Sports on the highlight reels. Like, you know, those are big personalities and they have nothing but yes people around them. Well, I'm not a yes person. And so, and especially, I'm sometimes working with people who are just physically far larger than me mm. as well. And, but. Isn't that weird how that's a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 100% a thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 100%, you know. Um, but when I go home to my three little kids, I got three beautiful little children, six and a half, five and a half right now, or five and, and two and a half, Molly, Sophie, and Charlie. Do they want the challenger walking through the door? That is me. That's mm -hmm. the me that's in my work environment. But I never wear my glasses around my kids. And when I walk through the door, I have this little I'm bracelet. I'm about those. I've got this little bracelet hanging on the a hook at the front door. And when we talk about, we were talking earlier so much about meaning and how we as human beings, we get to add narrative and story to anything. Mm. We can add meaning to anything. That's why when we meet someone who like they've lost a coffee mug and they're just distraught, it's because it meant something to them. Maybe someone gave it to them and it was in a moment where it was emotionally charged and you know, it's whatever it is. But when I, before I walk through that door, I make a very conscious intention that there is a different Todd, different self that's walking through that door. Mm -hmm. And when I open up the door, I've got a hook with this, with this um, uh, bracelet hanging on it, which Molly made for me. And it's got their three initials, Molly, Sophie, and Charlie. It's got only love and it's got my wife's name on it. Uh, the original one, which got lost, just had my kids' initials. Um, but when I put that on, I am now inspired by the identity of Mr. Rogers. He's the person that I most want to embody for my kids. That's interesting. Because if there is someone 
that embodies the characteristics and traits that I want my children to experience with me, which is playfulness, fun, patience. And a lot of clothes changing. And a lot of clothes changing. changing, Wonderful sweaters. Yes. (laughs) Um, That's who I most want to activate the traits of, Mm. right? And so here's what I know is that's not me being fake. That's not me pretending anything because what I know after 22 years of experience doing this, all of those qualities and traits already exist inside of me. Patience lives inside inside of me. It's just not flexed every single day when I'm in my entrepreneurial role. Mm. Playfulness or fun or goofiness doesn't necessarily have a place in my business the way that it is. Other businesses, yeah, playfulness could, could be a big part of it. But when I go through the door, I want to be that playful, fun self. And so when I put that on, you know, there is a state change. And that's me being very intentional. I'm creating a ritual so that I can be an absolute superstar. I want to be excellent in that area. I don't Why want to be average. It now? Because when I'm when I go away, uh, Molly oh, always hands it to me so that I'm that they're with me when I'm right. away. Yeah. But normally I wouldn't have it on kind of in, in but yeah. So yeah. because I'm in LA, I'm not in New York City. Right. I'm yeah, wearing yeah, it right yeah. now. Uh, I also knew that I'd be talking about it. So um, my point about that, because we're talking about the authentic self, mm. what I want to extrapolate out for people is you've got many selves that you can be authentic with because the current kind of definition of authenticity or authentic is that there's one you and there isn't one you, right? And so that you're, you were talking about being the most true to yourself as you can. That's, and I agree with that. The most true to the self that I, that I can be is that I want to be as amazing for my kids and give them the same amount of energy that I've just given nine hours in my day at work. Because how many people that are watching this right now spend and give a whole bunch of other people in their day that they don't really even care about a bunch of energy and then they go home energy depleted and just sort of slough through the rest of the evening despite the fact that the people that they love and care about the most, that they would be most distraught over if they lost them, they're not showing up for. Energy isn't this, you know, tank that gets depleted in your day. You know, if you want to believe that, then 100% it is. That's the paradigm that you're living through. That's your gravitational pull. Then 100% it is. Mine, it's not. I've got, I've got just an absolute abundance of energy that I get to walk through in the threshold of our apartment back in New York City that when I do, I look forward to it. I can't wait to walk through that and put on that so I can be phenomenal for my kids now and phenomenal for my wife. That's my existence, you know, and it can be for anybody else. And if you imagine Mr. Rogers for your kids, who do you imagine for your wife? Well, that's between. (laughs) (laughs) Very, Uh, very fair. Yeah. Very very fair. fair. But I'll I'll give you another example here because. um, (laughs) (laughs) I'm so fucking curious. No, I get it. I get it. Um, Yeah. Uh, So I've done a lot of media around the book. Um, Fortunate 132 that podcasts now. With yeah, this one? no, 114. This is 114. Jesus. Um, you know, done like NBC and CBS. PBS did a spot on it, and like you know, back in the motherland of Canada, you know, everyone jumped on board to support the the the, the Canadian hero. the Canadian Sun kind of thing, um, which is great. But uh, on a, a lot of those interviews, like I kind of have a uniform, it's like a blazer and a pocket square and all that and glasses, and uh, my wife. She was always giving me a rough time. She's like, you know, the person that I fell in love with is this like super funny, like you're a big jokester, like you love giving people a hard time. You're like always laughing, but that doesn't necessarily come out as much with you when you're doing your interviews. So I was on the Today Show just last month uh, with, uh, it was going to be with Hoda Copy and um, uh, Jenna Bush, but Hoda took some leave. And so then it was uh, Holly Robinson, Pete and um, uh, Jennifer Nettles, the lead singer for Sugarland. And, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's kind of that, it's that daytime talk type mm-hmm. of thing and, and they like the more playful thing. So when I was going on there, I was like, you know what? Who would I most want to show up as so I can have that more playful, fun personality that's there? Because it's there, I've got it. And it was uh, uh, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds and uh, Hugh Jackman. I love them in their interviews. Like they're funny, they're jokey. Mm. And so that's what I showed up as. This time I didn't wear the uniform of a blazer. I actually wore something very similar to this. Mm. And yeah, you look at that interview versus the other ones, just a different part of me was showing up in it. And you know, as soon as I got done, it went 
amazing. And immediately the producer's like, we've got to get you back. We want to talk about like more, this more and stuff. So that's my point about like this whole, I, there's a lot of people who are getting trapped by this idea of authenticity, authentic self. And I think people need to be really careful, be a lot more choosy about what they allow these definitions to be. Because I love the idea. I, I don't think that people are intentionally trying to deceive people around these words by any stretch of the imagination. Sure. But I think that they're being co-opted by a really bad um, I, a bad idea that is trapping many people because the reality is when you're just starting out, like you, you have this taste and this flavor of something that's better than what you are right now. Mm -hmm. And so there's this internal resistance and this struggle around that. And, and then people don't take the action. And, and so my advice to that is like, fuck that. Don't, I'm not so concerned about you being authentic because you thinking about calling your mom and telling her that you love her but then not doing it, that makes you feel good. Picking up the phone and calling your mom and for some people saying the tough words of I love you if you're not in a, in a, in a family that says that very often, it creates two totally different possibilities, right? Like that, that's uh, whatever it takes for you to pick up the phone and, and say those words, I like that person. Whatever it takes for someone to actually launch the video or you know launch the business whatever it took for you on the inside whether you were being fake and pretending to be someone else or not i don't care because you toppled the domino everyone's so concerned about the perceptions of other people i just don't care and i'm coming at it from the experience of people who've done it like you know what the greatest soccer player who'll be in the rankings of one of the top three soccer players of all time thinks when he's on the soccer field this is not in press conferences what player are we talking about i can't say because i don't let oh, people know who okay. my clients are but he fundamentally believes that no one deserves to be on the pitch with him he's personally offended <laughs> that people are sharing the blades of grass with him and so it he feels like it's his personal responsibility to destroy you and embarrass and humiliate you out there because of you don't put in the amount of work that I do. You do not put in the amount of work that I do to become this great. And it offends me that you're even on my team sometimes. And so now I've got to show you up and show you just how much it's going to take for you to even sniff my cleats. Wow. Now, some people think, well, that's an egotistical jerk. It's egotistical jerk if he was saying that in a press conference. That's why he's not saying it. But think about that from a healthy internal superego standpoint. If that helps you be the greatest player or competitor in your genre, then what does it matter? You know, it's actually super interesting. And I don't know where I come down on that. So my thing is, here's my thing. I'm a servant to greatness. Mm -hmm. That's what I've chosen to value. So if they're going to leverage the darkness that hard yeah. to get good. I will say, hey, it might work. Be a little bit careful. Watch yep. Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech and mm. you'll see the <laughs> toll that um, only relying on anger in the darkness, yeah. you know, the, it does extract a toll. Yeah. But it is, it is an extraordinary tool for some people to leverage. And I think the light and the dark both have massive utility. Yeah. I just think people have to be really careful about if you're always in that dark energy, sure. then uh, now if he were having to choose between it's to be the greatest, I must be in the dark energy all the time, then yeah, yeah I would have no beef with it. I yeah. just think it's probably a false dichotomy. He probably doesn't have to only rely on the dark and the hate and the you're not good enough. And so I worry like as a social animal that he'd probably have more fun if he found a way to elevate and inspire those around him and sure. still outwork them. Like here, here's the truth. And some, oh God, I'm about to turn some people off. I'm going to miss you when you unsubscribe. <laughs> um, here's the truth of me. I outwork everyone on this team. And I know the people right now are listening to this. So my team is hearing yeah. me say right now. Yeah. But this is not, this is not a, a bad thing. It's not a dark energy thing. It's no. like I want my team to know they can count on me 
yeah. to outwork them. They can count on me to carry a load that's heavier than anyone else. Yeah. That I want that, that I want to be out front. I want the first slings and arrows to hit me. Yeah. I want them to be able to file in behind me. Now, at the same time, I fucking love it when somebody wants to make me sweat. Mm. They're like, no, yeah. no, yeah. I'm going to play at your level. Yeah. I'm going to step out. Then it's like, I'm going to bury you <laughs> yeah. with love. Yeah. Love in my heart. Yeah. But I'm fucking coming for you, Will. Yeah. Will Vu. Your name is on my lips right now. Mm -hmm. I could hear the team laugh. <laughs> so that motherfucker is gunning for my position. In no uncertain terms, he said his goal in five years is to be co-CEO, which secretly means in five years he wants to be CEO. And yes. He's just trying to be kind. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to bury Will. But I'm going to do it in a way that uplifts him sure. and lets him know that yeah. I fucking want to sweat. Yeah. And God, yeah. if he can overtake me, I will be very impressed. Yeah. So it's like it you can get the same result without sliding so permanently into the Yeah, darkness. so when I'm describing what's going on in his head, I'm obviously saying it, I'm saying it in a very intense way, but there is an attitude of playfulness behind what he's also saying as well. So he's playing with dark and light. And I mean, I've, as someone who's now, you know, worked worked with him for a very long time, I've seen this huge evolution in his in his change. But what I just like about what you just did though, was see that what you just did that's what i would call as being authentic because i think what's really important for people that watch whether it's consuming little tidbits of you know snackables on social media is that they get the real and true story of what it's like and what it like that that's your mindset that i'm going to bury you with love right like well. yeah and that's for me it's like no i you know, coming into our orbit as clients, like, I'll win because we have this thing. We out care. We out care everybody else. You can't out care me because I care more. And mine comes from a very challenging place from a kid. You know, like I have this, the reason I can get challenged or not get challenged, but the reason I can get frustrated with some of the, you know, platitudes that are out there that are just not true is because I care a lot that people get the truth, like the real truth. Like our, our company is based on, you know, scientific research, right? That's why in the book, yeah, everyone gets the concept immediately. But what I want to get people to understand is, no, there's a lot of science behind why all these things work in the methodology that we put into using, you know, and shaping other people's identities and stuff. But I have an extraordinary level of compassion and, and that comes from, you know, I grew up on a farm and ranch, um, amazing parents, two older brothers that are great. And my, my younger sister went off to a church camp when I was uh, 12 years old because uh, I just, I was an extrovert. I just needed to get around people as much as I can. So if there was a Catholic camp this weekend, I was a Catholic. If there was a Protestant one the next week, I was a Protestant. If there was a, you know, a Baptist one, I was a Baptist. Didn't matter. I just wanted to be around people. And uh, went away to a camp and over the course, uh, two men singled me out and over the course of a couple of days, you know, sexually abused and raped me um, in a pretty bad way, right? When we were 12 years old, that's, uh, that's, n that's not an easy thing to deal with. Mm. Immediately when I got home uh, from that, you know, you're dealing with so much shame, so much humiliation, so much, you know, guilt, embarrassment, didn't want anyone to find out about it. Plus on top of all of the, you know, you know, story and kind of, you know, stuff that they put inside my head, um, dropped off my duffel bag at the front door and we had just put in a pool in our backyard, went to the garage, changed into a swimming, my swimming trunks and uh, proceeded to try to drown myself. In Whoa. The pool. So struggled with, you know, it didn't obviously happen, but struggled with like suicide throughout my teens and my twenties because I was trying to get away from that. And that's why I know I am world-class at mental game coaching mm. because you know, I know that some of the things that drive people to do the things that they do come from dark places, you know, but there is another side to that, that like that gift that I got from that experience was that I've got extraordinary level of compassion for the challenges that some people have gone through, which can be tough. But what I want people to know is that that doesn't need to be your story forever. That doesn't need to define you by any stretch of the imagination. How did you build back from that? Um, I don't know, like, uh, I went, I, I did a, I went internal with a lot of stuff, um, definitely changed my personality kind of in a, in a flash. I was always a, 
I was always a kind of a serious kid in that I just loved ruminating on ideas as a youngster, but I was far more kind of like playful, definitely. Um, turned me probably into a little bit more of a achiever because I wanted to get away from my province, really. I just kind of everywhere I went, I just saw reminders of things for me. Mm. That's probably explains why I've done so much travel and lived in so many places. Not the only thing that explains it, but uh, consumed as much information as I could, which was tough because I'm a huge dyslexic. Um, and so reading was always a challenge for me until I got diagnosed at 21. I, I went through all through school without getting diagnosed with dyslexia. Oh. I just thought I was, you know, you know, I kept it. I was very good at hiding it, but you know, that didn't, I, re- I never thought of myself as stupid or something like that, but I always felt like, you know, there's something about books that I'm drawn towards, but man, do these things ever challenge me? It's like the the hero's journey process of like entering the cave. I kept on going back to the cave to try to enter it and read. Mm. But, you know, I got into reading about the mind so that I could try and master it because it was a dark place for me all the time to, to go to, you know, like battled with, I mean, um, I still do sometimes battle with night terrors. Um, oh. Not as, not anywhere near as much anymore, but night terrors was something I battled for a really, really, really long time. So sleeping was tough. I kind of dreaded the idea of going to sleep and you know what, I mean, sleep is like the number one thing. Mm. I mean, the first thing I work with people on for, for performance, whether it's a, executive, an entrepreneur, leader, anyone is like anyone that's here, you know, getting your sleep and you're protecting that time is so important. And here I was, you know, like maybe sleeping four hours a night. Jesus. Um, it sounds like this may not be a need anymore, but have you looked at the studies on MDMA and PTSD? I was in, I was in the largest MDMA study. Oh shit. The one at Bellevue hospital in New York city. Did it help? Yes. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, and you know Tucker. Tucker's a really close friend as yes. well. And uh, so, yeah, MDMA. What MDMA did for me was it it created an anchor place where I could see that that amazing level of self love, which is something that you struggle with when you know you attach yourself to these stories. Mm. That, you know, because self-worth becomes a real big issue for people who've gone through things like this, especially when, you know, the the abusers are telling you that you're not worth it and that, you know, how can your family love you when they're not here to, you know, no one's here, you know, so how much can anyone really love you, you know, and they're just beating down and they did a very good systematic process of it over the course of those days. Um, And, but when, when I had MDMA for the first time, that anchor place that it gave me because it just it's it was like floating in a place of just just pure it was like dropping into like an ocean of like just pure self-love or bliss Mm. like it's really hard to describe to people i was like when i came out of it i was like okay like i know that that's that's a place that i can get to which then really started the kind of journey towards really kind of facing it finally because i never told anyone about this until just two years ago um, where I finally kind of was frayed at the edges because of a bunch of other circumstances that were happening around me, um, a business lawsuit and, and stuff where I was suing someone and, uh, and, you know, we had, had a tough childbirth with our little guy, Charlie, and, you know, my, my wife had a really tough go. And so I was sort of holding as much things up as I possibly could. It's the idea of like, you know, trying to keep all these different, um, Uh, beach balls below the surface of the water you know there's only so much you can do and finally this thing came to the surface because i hadn't necessarily dealt with it and um you know but steamrolled towards it and and worked through it but that 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 study i'm not going to say that it's because it's not a magic bullet for Mm -hmm. everybody um but you'd say that it did help start the 100 percent. and i mean just because right now the statistics on that i was in the third trial phase the which was the final trial phase of it Um, And the third trial phase, they kind of reserved for like the worst case scenario people, people who've been living with trauma and PTSD for um, an exorbitant amount of time. But I think the the latest stat, don't quote me exactly on it, but it's, I think it's uh, an 86% cure rate on the recurrence of PTSD, which if you know anything about other possible treatments for PTSD and trauma Mm. is an insane number. So I can't wait for it to be you know, legalized for people because it's going to be really hard for Congress to say no to a group of people that are former veterans mm-hmm. of the United States, you know, military. Um, 
and say no to its because it's been phenomenal. So the work that the Maps Institute has done at championing yeah. this and other people behind the scenes underground for a long time, giving people semblances of hope that, you know, there is a, a pathway to the other side has been amazing. So, you know, that's all me kind of coming back around to like, you know, that incident, you know, in some ways it really shaped kind of the direction that I took with getting into the mental game stuff. I needed it for myself. I was going to say like, man, I can imagine like talk about pieces clicking into place. So having gone through abuse like that yeah. and needing a version of yourself that's like the best of everything that maybe is somehow outside of that and hasn't been touched yeah. by that. Yeah. And 100%. Fuck, man. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, but in the end, like now that I know so much more about it, what I was tapping into to kind of avoid or not, yeah, in some ways it was avoiding, but you know, getting away from that identity that was wounded was tapping into that playful side, you mm -hmm. know, that, you know, when I went on the football field or whatever, which was a safe haven in some ways and sport was big time for me, um, allowed me to truly connect to this amazing superpower that we have. That's why I'm so passionate about getting people introduced to this phenomenon that everyone that's watching has already used you've used it because we use it when we're in our formative years between the age of one and seven when we're always you know you're pretending to be batman jumping off the sofa or you're pretending to be your favorite you know athlete on the front driveway to see and it's all answering the question what could i do if mm. what could i do if i you know was lebron james in this moment or what could i do if i was wayne gretzky or what could i do if i was batman or superman and you play with that idea and 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 when you take a look at that that section of your uh, of a child's or of a of a person's life that's where almost all of our development happens 1 to 7 and then when you look at it from a brain wave perspective children that are operating between the ages of 1 and 7 or living in the ages of 1 to 7 are operating in the theta brain wave state consistently they haven't developed into the beta, which is when frontal lobe starts to kick in, right? The development of the brain and you know, now our higher reasoning and thinking and judgment skills starts to kick in. And so that should be telling people that there's, a, there's something about that, um, that era of our lives that we can reconnect to. And how we can reconnect to it is our creative imagination. Creative imagination operates inside the theta brainwave state where we can suspend so many things and see ourselves in a different way. And, and alter ego is that was that kind of magical key to help unlock all of these possibilities that exist mm. inside of, you know, clients and, and other people now. It's fucking interesting, dude. Interesting concept. The book is out now. Yeah. Where can people get it? Everywhere. Airport bookstores, Amazon. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, That's thanks, very man. Exciting. Um, yeah, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you know, find it, you know, it's all around the globe, you know, and we're getting it, you know, sold the rights into a whole bunch of different languages already with it. So it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if people want to connect with me, they, you know, toddherman.me is my home base on the interwebs and, you know, all my activity on Instagram or social as well to, you know, where I share some behind the scenes of things that we're doing. So I love it. Yeah. Todd, thank you for joining us on Hell the yeah. show. This was amazing. We uh, we may have set a record here. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for the time. man. It was awesome. Absolutely. Thanks. Man. All right. Peace out, everybody. Till next time. Be legendary. Later. We only get one emotion at a time. That's how our brain works. One emotion. So our job is to really find the right state that we want to be in, the right emotional place, and use that rather than let the brain win. And if that is untrained and unconditioned, it will win.